Welcome to the Longest Turn Board Gaming Podcast. This is episode 47, Essen Top 5 Preview. My name is Tyler. Hello, this is Kevin. This is Tyson. We're going to talk about the games that we've been playing lately, then we're going to each highlight the top five games that we're most excited about coming out of Essen. None of us are going. No, we're not going. But looking through the list of the releases, there are a ton of good games. There are. And I, and I, you know, comparing it to what was released at Gen Con, I, I think there's tons more there is, coming out at Essen. There's that, over a thousand about. games on the Essen preview list. Yeah, I'm sure there's even more that aren't on the list. That's crazy. And, and there's yeah. enough difference from the Gen Con list to the, the Essen list that makes it like, Super exciting. If you went to one, you could feasibly go to both and be excited about a ton of new releases at either. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So next year we're going, right? Uh, I would like to. <laughs> when, uh, uh, when, yeah. Yeah. I'm, when not, going, I'm not going fun. next year. <laughs> but I would love to. It'd be but an awesome It would imagine. be awesome. Yeah. And then go tour uh, Germany and yeah, other dude. parts of Europe. It um, would be a fantastic trip. Absolutely. I would love to. I, there's a lot. I mean... That's the problem is that if I went to Germany, I don't think I could just go for Essen. It, there'd have to be a purpose because I've never been to Germany, and I think it would be worth, worthwhile to go for more than just Essen. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Sh- should we make this a little bit longer, Tyson? You got something to bring up? Because I know what's coming next. Oh, yeah. So we, we yeah, could just... We I'm could, a little, bit, a little, okay, bit, more, so a little here, bit more banter. Here's the deal. Oh. At some point on this podcast in a previous episode, I mentioned... Vienna sausages, pigs in a blanket, right? You did for, for some strange reason. Well, I don't, know I don't why. remember why. I right, don't remember right. what episode it was on. Uh-huh. But uh, it, it got its undue uh, hate I don't reaction. No, if it's undue. Well, and then and then you know we're moving along. We've gone on to future episodes, and then out of the blue, one of the guys on our Discord, Scott, uh, threw shade at my Vienna sausages comment and, and made the puking face symbol. So I was like, you know what? We're doing a taste test. Let's do, let's recreate the puking in real time. That's I, what you thought. So <laughs> I will say I grew up on, we would eat these every th- two or three weeks. It was, was that like the, your dinner was just, eating it was like a Sunday afternoon evening, uh, find it, fix it. Was dinner. this when you were yeah. out of MREs and like military rations? Uh, <laughs> it was from my childhood. So we're going to do a taste test, Kevin and Tyson. See, we, Tyson. So we, uh, Tyson and I did not agree to this. No, no. This, no, this was, was like, on us. Tyler was like, Oh, I'm so excited to record tonight. And now we know why. Well, Cause he was going to, he was going to like bring well, out the sausages. So, uh, Shelly's going to do it with you guys. So I'm, I'm going to get my wife down here we're each gonna have one they're gonna be amazing we walked in and shelly said these things are disgusting (laughs) shelly hasn't eaten them since she was a kid i haven't eaten rightfully so i was a kid either (laughs) and i will point out this is a step above spam okay so if you like spam vienna sausages is it a step above spam oh it's way above spam it's like barely below polish sausage Okay. Well, if you're processed meat, <laughs> period, canned, processed yeah, meat, canned meat. That's what we're. we're <laughs> We've got an unbiased toddler. Troop. Toddlers eat everything. What are you talking about? We have like uh, these chicken squares that we call them. That's actually filled with good things. <laughs> so these remind me of chicken squares. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I, know I think what you're talking it, about. I chicken squares like gone that. horribly, horribly yeah. wrong. <laughs> Is I think what this is. You want some mayonnaise to those get are it in? Paper oh my towels. gosh! No, Did you just say? Do you dip things in mayonnaise? Yeah, I lived in the it. Netherlands. Oh my gosh. Started with the fries. <laughs> okay, well, now I'm starting to understand why you like pigs. These okay. pigs in a blanket. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. I am more nervous to eat this than I've. I've eaten some weird stuff. Oh, Tyler just he's dug in. That's because he loves it. All right. Delicious. Uh huh. Oh, the croissants. Great. Cool, love it. <laughs> you didn't. You got bread only. No, it's croissant. I love croissants. He got the only good part. Mm. All right, Shelly, what do you think? Mm. Honest opinion. There are very few foods that I don't like. I'm like the least picky eater on the planet, and these are gross. <laughs> Whatever, Shelly. <laughs> um, it's not. It's not the flavor, well, it's the texture. The, the consistency. They taste, yeah, it's like somebody already chewed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah now like, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. I will say it's that. It's almost like it's been in a can for years. <laughs> All right. I mean. You guys are both negative. No, I, I, I will say that. I mean, as soon as I tasted it, it reminded me of 
my childhood to an extent because I ate some of these and liked them. But it also re- made me realize that maybe I didn't have taste in my childhood. Did you see your son's reaction to that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Was that good? Um, was that good? That's not a uh, face that he... No, he, no, hold he, on. Uh, it, was, it was hot. It was the temperature. No, I think... <laughs> that was... A, okay, you... Is I mean, it good? No, he... <laughs> yeah, it has been confirmed. A toddler does not like it. Okay. Hey, he was trying to get away from There you. are five people here, and four of them hate it. Okay, here we go. Hey. Okay, it's cold now. Now try it. What do you think? Is that good? Yeah. Oh, is it delicious? I like foods. Yeah, you like this food, huh? It's delicious, huh? I feel like he's Same. being forced to eat it. <laughs> Okay, take a big bite and then tell me if you like it or not. I feel like you're making me witness to something that I should be reporting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do you we think? take a break Is from this good? regularly scheduled podcast. Okay, go eat the rest. He's saying, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> like with the pained look on his face. Please, right. Dad's uh, making stuff. I will say, I do like you know, buttery croissants. The croissants are great. Yeah. So, and who doesn't like cheese? I was going to say. It's the, just a squishy the thing that's in the, the middle. Croissant. He cheated on To be fair, shot. I thought the taste was... Not as terrible as I would have expected. Yeah. Oh, he can't get enough. Look at that. <laughs> Is that good, Cade? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> he said yeah. He said that no. wasn't a no. Well, thanks for coming down. Yeah, I'm, nobody's going to blame me if you don't finish that. Yeah, I just have nowhere to put this. Oh, here's, the, here's, the, here's the plate. The trash pile? Is that what that is? No. I mean... I think I can understand how you, Tyler, as a kid, Tyler, could appreciate and enjoy that. Would this be a, a, a regular thing in your adult I, life? I would, uh, in my adult life? Yes. Like, I have not like, had them since my childhood. This was a first for me. So what was your oh, experience Because we were, we were talking, though. you know, taste buds change, and we were joking around. We kind of were hoping you would throw up immediately. <laughs> but but um, that obviously didn't happen. But, I mean, is it everything you hoped and dreamed it would be? Uh, it was, yeah, it was. My only disappointment was everybody else's reaction. So, uh, <laughs> except like for Cadence, that was well, but, but that couldn't have been uh, a shock, though. Yeah, no. It, no. It, I think you guys kind of had your mind made up before you tried it. I was trying to be open. And I was like, trying. Like I said, the taste was not, I can understand why somebody could appreciate that. I used to like Vienna sausages as a kid. That's the first time since I was probably a kid that I had a Vienna sausage and I tasted it and I remembered my experiences as a kid with it thinking I really liked it. But I think I liked the novelty of meat Little from a can. Hot dog in a can type <laughs> yeah, of thing. More yeah. than it's I, like, like cheese out of a can with yeah, the easy cheese. Exactly. <laughs> Which yeah, yeah. I don't like easy cheese or any of these like really like super processed cheese yeah, type things. The stuff whatever. that is super processed or not really well. It's not gourmet food. That a thousand years from now, it's going to be just as good as yeah. it is now type yeah. of thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's apocalyptic. So like McDonald's well. food? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I yeah. don't like McDonald's I don't anymore either. than I used you, to as a kid. So. Yeah. Yeah. You won't catch me dead in a McDonald's. So, Yeah, so uh, that's probably long enough of that content. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how much of that actually makes the cut. But I'm still waiting to hear. Logan's taste testing it right now, so I'm going to get a text here and see what he says. Well, let's uh, you know have a break in what we've been playing lately to get an update on Logan's thoughts. Sounds good. Sure. Well, and we know that uh, Logan just talked about, was on the podcast with Tyler for the first time. And as listeners can attest, Logan does tend to like the things that his dad likes, so... That's true. Maybe some influence there. Is that what you're getting at? I, I would never assume to uh, say anything that is undue influence, like force feeding your child a, a sausage. <laughs> you like this, don't you? <laughs> Eat it was like, good. It's good. It's uh-huh. good. Yes. Yeah. Yes, right. it is good. <laughs> uh, do you, have you guys been playing games lately? Uh, yeah. The past few weeks, it's been a little bit of a lull. Yes, for me too. But, yeah. but I've, I've had, I've played some good games. For sure. I've gotten some games played, but not nearly as many as I would have liked. I was out of town for an entire week, uh, went to Alabama, and I the only thing I played there was for Northwood, 
which we've talked about, and I, I liked it even better this time. But I, aside from that, I really don't feel like I've been playing very much. I've been playing more on BGA than That's I normally have. Kind of been where I've at. Been at. Yeah, I've got a lot of games going on BGA. A lot of good games going yes. on BGA, which I'm really excited about. We've got a awesome game of Anachrony going on that I'm loving that. I have no idea how it's going to end up. I yeah. don't think I'm going to win, but I'm... I'm not sure. Thoroughly about enjoying the play. Kuroto Shiro from our Discord joined in that one, and I'm not sure that he's loving that one as much. But. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't but know how she's playing, again, but it's, it's it's a harder one to kind of understand from a PGA perspective. But I'm so glad that it's on there because once you do understand it, it there's a lot to explore. It is great. Well, we got a Marco Polo two started. Yeah, nice. Which, by the way, it's paused on my turn for the last day or so because I have not. Uh, updated myself on it i'm gonna wing wing it this first play and then i think after that i'll i'll look into what the differences are but yeah we've got a good game of res going res arcana we do i'm very excited about that i game. see i knew ex- i see exactly what you're doing yeah which is it's, it's awesome and uh i uh, i did not do a draft on this one and that no. that, that wasn't that was on accident right? yeah i, just I didn't, figured it was i didn't select the draft option but I, like like we've talked about before i enjoy that game just getting a hand of cards and trying to figure it out i think you have to use your brain even a little more <laughs> when 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 uh, you do that option but i'm excited to see how that one yeah plays out. so yeah got some good games on bj going so uh i I mentioned this in the last episode or two episodes ago um, that uh, for my birthday, my buddy got me two starter decks of Lorcana. Um, and I've had a chance to play that three times with my 10 year old and uh, happy to say it is a ton of fun. My biggest complaint about this game at this point is you can't find it anywhere. So if you, even if I wanted to get boosters, which I do, I want to get boosters. I can't find boosters to get right. So, so we've been playing with the starter deck and we've been having a great time with it. And she's, uh, she picked up on it pretty quick. So the way Lorcana works, it's a, a TCG. So a trading card game, you have a starter deck uh, it's a 60 card deck. That's the minimum deck size that you can have. And uh, you can add as many cards as you want to that deck. But I think most people are probably going to keep it down to about 60 cards. Um, you uh, get it all shuffled up. You draw seven cards. You have a chance for a mulligan. If you don't like some of the cards, put them on the bottom. You drop to seven again, and then you start the game. On your turn, you will draw a card, unless it's the first turn. The first player doesn't get a draw, but on your turn, you will draw a card, and then you have some options. Uh, You will play ink on those. um, Well, you can play a card for ink, and there has to be a little inkwell symbol on that card. It goes face down, and that's the resource. Your resources in the game are your ink. Um, You it's called exert or tap or turn the card 90 degrees exhaust, like whatever game you're playing, it's all different terms, right? So you exert the card and then uh, you pay the ink cost and you can get characters out of your hand. You can get items down. You can get actions that are one-time shots. And uh, that's the general flow of the game. So the characters, they come out and you have to wait for their ink to dry. You can't use them immediately on your next turn, then you can use those characters to either quest or challenge. If you challenge, your characters have an attack and then a willpower, which is a defense value. You can um, exert those cards and you can attack or challenge one of your opponent's cards. And it's super easy. You just compare the attack to the willpower. You knock them out. They knock you out. You do damage simultaneously. If you don't get damage equal to your willpower, you stay in your play area and you just put damage counters on your card. That's the first thing you can do with your character. Second thing is you quest, and this is how you win the game. You have to get 20 lore in order to win. So if your character has a little lore symbol on it, you can be one, two, or three, you will quest, and then you will get that amount of lore. Whoever gets to 20 lore first is the winner. Um, There are, you know, just like any trading card game, there are keywords on the cards that's going to break all the rules and, you get to do cool things. There's synergies. And really the best thing about these types of games is you get the boosters, you build your own deck, and then you test out that deck to see how it works with, with your buddies or your family. Not to that point yet because I don't have any, <laughs> any boosters, but I'm excited to get to that point um, once it's more readily available. So, so from a mechanics standpoint, to me, it sounds very 
stereotypical trading card game, right? Yeah. Like there's a lot of stuff going on here. Even the drying the ink, right? That's the summoning, summoning sickness, sickness type yep. of a thing. Exactly. There's, there's a lot of things. You got to get your cards out there. And then once you get them out there, you got to start using them to hone off one another to use this, the, the, uh, keywords. And yep. even it sounds like you said, Challenge and quest are the two options, pretty much, right? Challenge and quest. The the difference is, I think in a lot of games, you're doing direct damage to your opponent. And as soon as you do 20 damage to your opponent, then you win. This one says, okay, you can challenge your opponent's characters, but you are questing. And questing is is where it's a little bit different than a lot of trading card games, I think. And that's what I was going to ask. So challenging your opponent, it sounds like the primary reason you would want to do that is to slow or stop their engine. Yep. So if you see they have a character that's questing for three every turn, for example, you can then target that character, challenge that character, and try to get them knocked out. And you don't get any quest value for stopping somebody with a quest value on their card or anything like that. So So it doesn't add to your 20. No, you're exactly right. So you're either trying to slow them down or you are questing yourself. Right. And you have those two options. What's kind of a little bit interesting, too, is you can only challenge characters that have been exerted. So if a character, you know, a character is going to come out, they're not going to be exerted. They're going to have to drive for a turn. But then if they don't exert that character to either, either challenge or quest, or if they use a card ability to unexert the character, then they can't be targeted for a challenge, which is a little bit different, too. It does sound like it has a little bit of differences from other trading card games, but core like fundamentally yeah. it's it, pretty much a trading card it's a game. trading card game so yeah. would you say then if i were to pick this up and i weren't a disney fan for example is there any real reason for me to be playing this or is this uh this like basically feeding disney fans so i think the theme takes it a long ways for sure if you're a disney fan like the art is amazing it's thematic um so it's gonna draw you in if you're a disney fan um But I think there's a game there too, right? And I think there's an interesting game and it's only going to get better once there's more chapters that come out, more, a bigger card pool that you can use to build your deck. I mean, like I said, that's the fun part of these games. It's like Lord of the Rings, LCG or Arkham Horror. It's super fun to build your deck beforehand, right? And then test it out. And I think this game does it well. It's got fun keywords, where you know there's the the rush where you get it out and you can immediately challenge instead of waiting for your ink to dry. There's the bodyguards. You can sing songs, which is cool. That's thematic for Disney, right? Huh. So singing a song means you can exhaust one of your characters that has a certain value, and you can get that card out for free. And the songs are like you know Disney songs. So if you're a Disney fan, you're probably going to start singing that song. You're like uh, Gaston's going to sing a whole new world or, you know, something like that, you know? Nice. So that's kind of fun thematically, but, but to your point, yes, I think people would enjoy it, but you're going to get more enjoyment out of it. If you're a Disney fan for sure. So how much does your daughter like it? She likes it. So I asked her, it's she, the middle. Yeah. She, it's the 10 year old. Um, she, I, asked, I told her, Hey, do you want to play it? And this was yesterday. Cause I wanted to get at least one more play in before talking about it. She's like, Oh yeah. She was super excited and like genuinely wanted to play the game. Um, there's, I think a few mechanics that she's still trying to wrap her head around, but, um, she picked up on it pretty quick. Nice. It's not, I mean, it's definitely not magic as far as complexity goes. I think it's definitely well, and that's how a little like, bit, uh, more family friendly than that. Right. One. And that sounds like it has a spot then like that, yeah. that it can, it Absolutely. can stay fresh because of that. It's more accessible perhaps. And, and the theme is obviously more accessible for well, a larger audience than say magic, but, they, and I'm sure they'll add new actions and stuff yep. with future decks. And yeah, there's going to probably be a theme or something new to every new chapter that they add. Right. I would love to play this. Like, I don't know that I'm at the point where I would want to pick up a copy, like start good building, luck finding right? it, like finding it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I looked again and I couldn't find it. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of in the same spot as you, Tyson. I, I would love to play it, but I wonder if like, this is going to be something like uh star Wars destinies, right? Which is more of a flash in the pan, kind of a, a trading card game. And to me, Star Wars Destinies even sounded like it had more uh, mechanically unique kind of things to set it apart as a, a and it had the one with hyper, dice. It had the dice. Yeah, in so it. that that was the problem with that one is the, the manufacturing cost of a dice. I think kind of torpedoed that a little bit. That's but, that, but that's here's a good point. Here's why I think Lorcana may have staying power is because it's bringing in collectors of Disney, right? And like and Disney fans in general. So it, it has a wider base to become more successful. I think, and you know, 
like gamers, I don't know if gamers are really going to, they're going to stick to magic, I would think, or these other, right. you know, TCGs. But I think families are going to love this. But um, I mean, you got Pokemon so, too. And collectors, like some of these cards, these enchanted cards that are super rare. Uh, there's an Elsa one that's going for like 700 bucks. Wow. You know? So collectors, I mean, they're going to be all over that. Right. So what's your future level of commitment to this financially? Uh, well, I mean, I, I told my wife, if there's boosters, <laughs> buy like 10 of them, you know, and there's, <laughs> there's six, but there's six bucks a shot. So, I mean, I, I don't know who knows, but it's one of those things. Like when I was into dice masters, it was at target. And every time I went to target, I'm like, I'll buy 10 packs. <laughs> you know, hey, hey kids, you want fix? Yeah, hey kids, do you want to you want to open up some dice masters? <laughs> hey, if we, if we get a super rare, we're going to do the happy dance around the table. You know, and it's just, I mean, it is. It, it's one of those things where you could sink a lot of money into it, but it is exciting to open up a booster pack because you don't know what you're going to get. No, you get is, a lot of duplicates, but it's just fun, right? That is a fun experience. Yeah, like to have, and regardless of how invested you are in the game or the theme, like I. I played games growing up like Magi Nation. I did uh, Pokemon. I did a couple of other okay, yeah. trading card games. And while they weren't like the, the most mainstay ones, I mean, Pokemon was, but like while they weren't the most mainstay ones, I remember collecting and being like, what's next? What am I going to get out of this booster pack? Because it was, yeah. it's an exciting, fun experience. Where there's, you know, launch parties for the new sets that come out and that kind of stuff. Well, it's interesting because there's been studies done on where the highest level of enjoyment comes from playing a board games or getting board games. And oftentimes one of the highest levels of fun for people is when they first receive their board game and they open it. So that whole new box smell, that whole like oh, yeah. going through sleeving. all the components. Nope. We're not Punching. talking about sleeving. That doesn't yeah. count in here. Well, I mean, for some people. <laughs> yeah. But like that, that first initial exposure to the game right yeah, like no. that is a part of it and tcgs just took that and capitalized on that but, but and, and legacy games what's the best part of a legacy oh, absolutely game? yep i got a discovery. new box i got a new box i can open that like every it's like opening a new game and it's exciting right so yeah. i mean yeah they're definitely they're definitely onto something here i yeah. i predict that lorcana will not have staying power this time next year we won't be seeing it but I think that it has the potential to prove me wrong. And some of the points you brought up about uh, Destiny's, like the manufacturing costs and things like that, and maybe not as wide a, a, a IP base of fans because Disney does have more. I could be proved wrong, but I'll be I'll be surprised. It, it's got that combined with the fact that Disney has a devoted fan base. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Collectors, Disney collectors are, gonna be, are all over yeah. this, right? Yeah. All over. I mean, I think. Sure, but what's, if the, it does, what's the Venn diagram it, of Disney uh, collectors and tr trading card players? If that's it, what I want. If it does flame out, it's going to be longer than a year. That's for sure. It'll be like two years and then it, then it goes away. But I, it's like the question is is it going to rival magic? And Pokemon, I don't think and Yu-Gi-Oh. No. Is, is it going to get? In, is it going to be the, those? And then Lorcana. Is there going to be four big trading card games? And is the market big enough that it can support those? You know, four. I, I don't know. It'll be interesting. And then you know, we've talked about it, Star Wars Unlimited. It's coming out next year. Yeah, I think Star Wars Unlimited has a bigger chance of not sticking around, but I think it's probably a better game. But. I'm excited. Like playing both, I think. I think Star Wars and I want to play a game. Yeah, I, I want to try them both. I'm excited for the Star Wars one. Yeah, more so than Lorcana. So the theme probably draws you in a little bit more, right? Yeah, yeah. Even though maybe you're not as big a Star Wars fan as you have been in the past. Well, I don't. You know, we don't need to go there. So we'll we'll move on. <laughs> that, was, that was a pretty good deep dive of Lorcana that we just had from Kevin. That's true. Well, you guys participated too in the conversation. No, no, no. Right? It, yeah. I'm just saying. Uh, I wanted to move on and talk about a game that I've been playing lately, and it is called Deep Dive. Whoa! Oh, I whoa, see what you did. Whoa! Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, that okay. That was Tyson-esque, right? That, that, I mean, I think that's probably your best transition ever. Right there. <laughs> it might be. The uh, bar is set high. So do you guys have this game? No. Yeah, I've got it. Have you played it? Uh, I have not played it. Okay, so this was uh, part of the two-game Kickstarter with Point City from Flat Out Games and AEG. It's a push-your-luck set collection game. I actually played a review copy that we got at Gen Con uh, from AEG. 
Deep Dive is a one to six player game that's very quick. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes and it says ages 10 and up. It has a weight of one out of five on BGG, which is the lowest, I believe. And that is warranted because this is a very simple game. Uh, so in Deep Dive, you're controlling a waddle of three penguins and you are diving into the depths of the ocean in search of food. You're trying to collect a set of three different colors of food, as many sets as you can. Uh, there are different depth levels that you can dive to in the ocean. Uh, and the further you dive, the more valuable the food are and the points on those food tokens. Um, at each level, there is a pile of face down tokens and on your turn, you take one of your penguins and you pick a token and you flip it over. And if it's a predator, you're, that penguin's captured and you get nothing. Okay. If it's a thing of bubbles, then you have to go to a lower depth. Uh, if it is a food or a rock uh, token, then you can choose to either collect it or go to a, a lower depth. But if you do, you're passing up the chance to take the token that you flipped over. So there's five levels. Um, and at the very bottom, they're like 10 point tokens, but there's also, a, a, I think more predators down at the bottom too. So uh, on your turn, so you know if, if you collect one of the rocks, you can use that uh, later on to immediately dive to whatever level you want to. So basically to the bottom to go for those 10 pointers places where your, your exist, your other penguins have been captured or I would like to think eaten by the predators. Uh, you, the predator is distracted. And so you can automatically skip that level, that tier or that depth on future dives. So basically there's three different colors you put them in a co there's one column per food in front of you. So when you collect a y two yellows or a yellow, you'll put it in the yellow column and then another yellow in the, in the yellow column. Each set of all three that you have will score all the points that are on those tiles at the end of the game. If you don't have a complete set, then you'll score half rounded down of the points that are on the partial set that you have. So that you play until one of all of the piles has been flipped over at any depth and then everybody gets another turn it's a really simple game 15 20 minutes i've only played this at two player i will say that it was your favorite game <laughs> it it was it was a relaxing play i love how at the the top tier the top you know the shallowest point the tiles are all a very light blue and then the gradients gradually get darker and darker blue until the ones at the at the bottom are are, are very dark blue. I thought that was cool. Uh, it's a very simple push your luck uh, set collection game that I didn't feel like provided a lot of tension. Um, it, that's not good for a push your luck game. Yeah, if it doesn't provide tension, because that's kind of what push your luck is, <laughs> right? And, and and maybe it was because we were just playing in a two player, but it was like, oh, I I got caught by a predator. If if your third penguin gets caught by a predator, you pull them all back and you get to select a food token off of one of those levels that they were caught at. Was it not exciting at all? Like you had the choice to go to a, a further depth, right? Was that decision not exciting to go like all the way down to the bottom and, and get a I, a, big, I, a big food token I, down there? Or? No, I didn't think so. Oh, like I was, so. Okay. unless there was a specific color that I wanted up at a shallower depth that had been flipped over by someone else or me previously that I now made sense for me to collect. I was always trying to go to the bottom. And I think maybe because it, we were just playing at two players, like, Oh, I got my, pre I got caught three seconds later. It's my turn again, because that's how quick the turns are. Maybe it'd feel a little different if five or six people were sitting around the table playing and it's like, Oh, it, you know, I, I got caught. Now I have to actually wait. So it, it feels like there's more build up or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. more riding on my actual turn, but in a two player, they're so quick. So yeah, I don't know how many more plays I'll get of this. I will say I have a three-year-old. You may have heard him earlier on this episode. Uh, he's almost three. And this is a game that I would bust out in a year or two and play with him. And I think he would absolutely love it. I think the 
the, the, the excitement of flipping over a tile and it, having it being food or, or uh, a predator, I think he, a, a, a younger child would totally dig that. You know, similar to like when you play memory with younger kids and they're flipping over the tiles. Oh, they got a match. You know, I, I think there's something there, you know, and then, and then the choice of trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper. I think for a child, it might be really exciting. And so I'm, I'm definitely going to hang on to it and bust it out in a couple of years for, for, uh, Caden so that he can get some, I think there's joy to be had out of it for so him. Here's the trick with kids games, right? Like finding a kid's game that's enjoyable for your kid and enjoyable for the parents. Yeah. Right. Th- this doesn't sound like it quite gets there for you. Uh, right? you know, it's fine. Like I said, it was relaxing. So okay. if he was enjoying it or we were enjoying it as a family and he was just eating then it up, then, then it's it would, it's totally worth it. Oh, absolutely. But you said that this plays up to six players. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I do wonder what it's going to be like at that higher player count based off of what you're saying. Of, there could be that tension of maybe I have to sit out longer watching other people do stuff like Maybe that does add to it. I would be curious, based yeah. off of that, what's the higher player count? What's the optimal player count on this going to look like? And does that change up your experience at right. all? Right. And, and I would still like to try it one more time with, with an actual pl- decent player count and, and see if it changes it at all. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, def- I'll definitely play this one. It, this reminds me, I mean, it's a completely different mechanic, but it's a pressure luck game. Have you guys played Spookies before? It's, uh-uh. a, it's a Haba game? No fantastic push your luck game and it's a uh, it's a haunted house theme so the theme is i think more interesting to me than diving with penguins to get food yeah but it works well with kids um it's it you know you're rolling dice it's got exciting moments in it it's fun for adults um so i you know i, I think that one probably would be a better option than this one, without having played it, I may play it and change my mind. Yeah. And I do own it because I, I back the Kickstarter and I will play it. So, but, but it, it reminded me of Spookies as far as a, a good pressure luck game huh. geared more towards kids. So, uh, yeah, I backed the Point City part of the uh, Kickstarter. And oh. I would have to say that Point City is definitely the, uh, the one that I like more of the two. Yeah. So, yeah, great. Point City is great. Yeah. But uh, I mean, saying a waddle of penguins is kind of fun. Well, and it did sound like you enjoyed the savagery of potentially consuming <laughs> penguins. But, hey. I like to think they were eaten. <laughs> did I say? I did say that. Yeah, you did say that. I mean, we got to make it exciting this, somehow. What's this fuzzy ocean world where everything just coexists and nothing gets eaten? Like, come on, <laughs> you're like a planet Earth or whatever those documentary <laughs> things are that I, yeah. just watch them wait for their them to get eaten. Yeah. They I, get you attached to the pup and then it gets <laughs> murdered. Yeah, yeah. I did find it funny that you're like. I really like how the colors change. (laughs) (laughs) You're reaching there, man. (laughs) I I thought I liked that detail. That was, no, that is kind of cool. I I agree with that. And it probably, it does from pictures. It looks like when it's set up, set up, it looks kind of cool. Yeah. And and the penguin meeples were cool. Each player has three different shaped ones. None of them have bite marks in them. That's not one of the shapes. (laughs) One of them has his tail. Overplayed. Tail chewed off. Yeah. There we go. Tyson. Tyson, what have you been playing lately? Transition. You just talked about deep diving a game. I'm going to go a little bit more surface level here, and I'm going to talk about a game called NAR, where you're sailing across the ocean, not into the ocean. Ooh. Okay, that Look actually that works. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Pressure's on for me. Yeah. Spoiler alert, it's going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I saw this on the hotness. It had reached like number one on the BGG hotness list. I was like, I don't care about that. I don't know what's going on. Just looking at the cover, I was like, I'm not even going to click on it. But then I saw that it showed up on BGA. Uh, and I was like, okay, now I've got to see what the what the hype is about this game. First, it's designed by Thomas DuPont. The art is by Carrion Antoine and published by Bombix. Essentially what this game is, is if you like Century Spice Road or you like Splendor style games, this is a Tableau engine building game. And similar to those, it's that cascading kind of vibe that you get. What you're doing is you're building a crew of Vikings so that you can go and explore and gain more resources and victory points. The game plays that the first player to reach 40 points 
is going to trigger the end game. Everybody gets the same amount of turns. So if the first player triggers the end game, everybody gets one more turn. But if it's the last player, then the game immediately ends. What you're doing is collecting these Vikings, and this is colorblind friendly. They use a, a, a universal color language in here that was actually really intuitive and made a lot of sense to me when I looked at it. But each Viking comes in one of these five different colors, green, red, purple, yellow, or blue. First, you play a Viking from your hand. You always have th three Vikings in your hand. When you play a Viking, you place it down in a tableau in front of you in like colors. When I play on a pile of colors, I'm going to get all the benefits of every Viking that is in that pile. So if I have two Vikings in there and they both score victory points, I get two victory points. Each Viking has different symbols on them to include symbols that give you tokens that allow you to uh, be a little bit more versatile in what you're doing. They have bracelets, which allow you to trade, which uh, goes into the exploration action, which I'll talk about here in a second. And they have... Um, a like a prestige kind of a, a I can't remember exactly what it's called but every round the more prestigious you are as a viking uh the more points that you will earn every turn so you can go up this track that if you get far enough you could potentially get up to five victory points at the start of every one of your turns so deciding which type of resource you're going after and which color of viking you're going after makes for some really interesting decisions once you've played a card, whatever color that, of card you played, you can draft from the row in the color spot. So there are five different locations on the main board that correspond to a color. Every round uh, that a card is taken from a spot, you're going to replace it from the deck. If uh, you play a red card, you can for free take the red um, slot card. That doesn't mean it's going to be a red card because it could be any one of the cards that is is put into that spot. But you can take that for free or you can spend one of these uh, special tokens that you can get uh, and choose any card that is available to draft on that row. But those are kind of hard to come by if you're not working towards them. So it's an interesting decision there. The other thing I'll explain is exploration. So you can either draft a card, or play, play and draft a card, or you can explore at the start of your turn. To explore, you're going to take an island at the top of the board, and each of these islands have requisite amounts of cards or tokens that you have to spend. For example, uh, there's one that scores like eight points and allows you to draw a free card. And to do that one, you have to spend like three purple cards and two red cards. You can use some of those tokens to make up the difference if you don't have a, enough purple or red cards. However you want, you can mix and match. But you're going to take the cards in front of you in your tableau and spend them and discard them. And then you can take this other token. When you do that, on these exploration cards, they have three columns that are, are there. And each column is going to have a symbol potentially in it. You can use the red bracelet tokens to trade at the start or end of your turn whenever you want. And when you do that, when you trade, you're going to get the benefits of whatever column uh, you're you're spending the bracelets on. So if you want the whatever benefits are in the left column, you spend one bracelet. If you want the, what's in the middle column, you have to spend two bracelets and you get the benefits in the left and the middle column. If you want all three, you spend three bracelets and you can get all the benefits that you've done. And you can continually stack these islands on. And so the more that you, exploration you do, the more benefits you're going to get from round to round whenever you trade. So there's surprisingly a lot of different paths to victory in this game. And I've really been enjoying this. I've played this real time probably five times. It plays in 15 to 20 minutes. The, every time I've played it, it's been really fast play. Uh, and then I've also played a number of turn-based games. I've probably played this game 10 to 15 times within the last week. And I'm really enjoying what this game does. I tried to go out and find and purchase a copy. But like I said, I couldn't find an available copy. So this is one that I'm going to be keeping my eye on because the relatively short play time, that kind of tableau engine building mechanism, it all really, I think, is done very well. And for me, I think I would prefer this game over Splendor or Century Spice. Um, and I think that this game has a lot of potential. And you could add more expansions and things to it, but I'm really enjoying this game so far. 
Yeah, it looks good. I like the art style. I think yeah, I do really, too. I think it looks really cool. I like it. And I love Century Spice Road. I have a game going of that on uh, on BGA now and love it. And if this one's similar, and it sounds like it's maybe the same weight, engine builder type of thing with a little bit more going on, I think I definitely, like, I definitely want to check it out. Yeah. It's like in that same weight as Furnace, too. Yes, it is. Very similar. To, if you like Furnace, this would also be similar to that style of game. But for me, like I think that this is a, a, a quicker, uh, snappier game, and you're really doing only one thing on your turn, which makes it like really easy to, to do and pick up and go. Um, I've really liked it a lot, and I, I, like, I think that... There is, if you like Century Spice Road, I think there is plenty of justification that you could have both of these games in your collection if you wanted. Uh, but f- just for me, I think I prefer this one slightly more. Well, I, I like this weight of game. Uh, it's easy to get out with my family and play if it's a quick play time. And like, I love games that are, are quicker, but have good meaty decisions to them. And it sounds like this one's good. I, no, I, exactly. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, would, I would absolutely... Um, you know, own this and Century Spice. Yeah, like Furnace. I have not played Furnace yet, but yes. Uh, Something to be aware of. This game does have a unique uh, sleeve card size, French tarot, and that is 61 by 112. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. if you are going to get a copy, Tyson, I might have some of those, but I'll have to check. This is the kind of content people listen to. Yeah. To our this show is, for this so is don't needed. you poo poo the sleeve oh. talk ah. tyson i would never never dream of uh sleeving any of my cards for this game <laughs> okay well you're lost you're lost all right that was nar nar don't you just want to say it like that like a, yeah. a norseman that's that's a, that's a pirate that wasn't a norseman <laughs> huh. nar nar, nar. <laughs> A Norseman that is like, was more Nar. Like yeah, that's why I say it. pirates. Yeah. Nar. Yeah, mine was more Norseman. Yeah, yours was like, like your second one was. Nar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what you're. Clear about, difference. Tyson. Clear difference. I apologize. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not well versed on the you know, intricacies you know, of you're the not, R. You're not. You know what word pirate? my wife makes fun of me for? A lot of. Things. I don't know what. What day of the week comes after Tuesday? Wednesday. So do I you say Wednesday. No, I say Wednesday. Not Wait, Wednesday. Do you do this on purpose to like? You no, say, you, you, that's just how you say it. It's just how I say it. And when, her her when, brother does it too, and but I, she won't tease him about it. So this read, is a thing. <laughs> yeah, Wednesday. When, Wednesday. That's you read too much Winnie the Pooh growing up. Are you? It's a blustery day. It's Wednesday. It's aptly aptly named. Come on. Wow. <laughs> Did you read that that's, to your kid? That's last, possible. Tonight or no, something? No. Oh, okay. Well, the memory recall is amazing. I had a guy uh, approach me, and and it was an old retired guy on vacation, and he said that. And so, like, from now on, I will never not think of Woody the Pooh when I hear Wednesday. I could quote Socks and Fox and Socks right now from memory, all 75 pages of it. Nice. Dr. Seuss. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, there is no transition yeah. that I could that possibly one. do. <laughs> I mean, you said you were doomed anyways. I, uh, yeah. The, even or if, the transition was. Even if it, even lots if, of options. Even if it was a softball, I would screw up the transition. But All right. So uh, the game I'm going to talk about, I, I'm not going to talk much about this one because we did a whole feature uh, episode about Undaunted. Um but Mark and I, we, we recently finished the Undaunted Stalingrad campaign, and I wanted just to talk briefly about it to give some of my thoughts now that I have the perspective of the whole campaign. Um, if you listen to our review, you know that uh, you know we loved it. It's fantastic. And nothing has changed in that regard. It's still fantastic. Um, so a few things that I wanted to bring up. So uh, the first thing was, did it? end with a satisfying conclusion, right? Um, And it absolutely did. One thing I will mention, there is um, multiple endings to this game based on, you know, the branching narrative that you follow throughout the campaign. Um, This ended a little, our campaign ended a little bit earlier than I think other campaigns. Um, The final scenario that we played was an epic, fun scenario. Um, We did look to see if, because if Mark would have won this last one, where it would have gone. And 
holy cow, that scenario was just absolutely bonkers and crazy. Um, so I feel just, just a little bit, uh, bad that we didn't get there, but where we ended was still awesome and was still an amazing scenario. So yes, it did. And it did end in a satisfying way for sure. It's kind of like like something on Price is Right where you win something and then they show you what the next you could have won. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And we read a little bit about how that scenario would have played out, uh-huh. which is a spoiler, I guess, potentially if I play through the campaign again. But um, yeah, it's uh, it would have been just an epic. You're playing with basically half of the map of Stalingrad. Oh, wow. Yeah. So all said and done, how many games did you end up playing to complete this entire campaign? Yeah, I think, and let me check. I think we played 14. Um, Yep. And then 15 or 16, the max? We played 14, and it looks like 15 or 16 is the max. Okay. Yeah. So you got pretty close to the... the, We got pretty close to the... Experiencing almost everything it has to I think you guys... Talked about how amazing your your tenth scenario was, right? Or was it your? It ninth? was scenario nine. Nine. Yeah. Did you have more scenarios like that that just kind of blew you away? That that I think was the the best, most epic scenario that we played. But and the reason for that is because there was this twist, and I'm not going to obviously explain what that was, but there was a twist in the middle that just kind of whoa, <laughs> like Mark knew about it. I didn't. And when it happened, I'm like, whoa, mind blown. And it just changed up the whole scenario. There are other scenarios that came after that, that had similar things that happened. Um, and, uh, I, I knew, and it's, it's cool when you have that information and the other person doesn't. Right. And I had the information this time and it kind of blew Mark's mind. And this was the last scenario that we played, um, which was really fun, you know? So, but, but I think scenario nine for us was the the best, um, and, uh, and I don't know, there may be other scenarios as you go down different paths that are just as epic, but that one for us was just awesome. Nice. So and what I really love about it is the variety of the missions. The missions all felt unique. There was different strategies. Um, a lot of them you're controlling areas, others you're just trying to cause casualties, but they were all unique or getting to an exit point, you know, so they all felt unique and, and, uh, just really, really fun. Um, they were, uh, Mostly balanced, I thought. There was a few of them in there that felt a little bit more skewed towards one side than you would want, maybe. And maybe that was the design. Uh, to is a little bit of a catch-up mechanic. I don't know. But the majority of the scenarios came down to the end, which was awesome. And it was cool because you would read the briefing and you're like, I don't see how this is going to work. Or I don't see how this is going to be balanced. And then when you start playing, it's like, oh, this is genius, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is totally balanced and it's going to come down to the end. And a lot of times it did. So that was really cool. The thematic moments are awesome. I had um, a casualty. One of my riflemen got injured, brought in a recruit. He had a shovel. He had zero range. I'm like, <laughs> I have no other option with this guy. I'm going to do a range shovel attack. So <laughs> I was like, I have to roll a zero because Mark was like four, uh, four spaces away. And he was, he was fortified in a building and I had this, this <laughs> rifleman with the shovel and I'm like, I got to roll a zero. I rolled a zero. It was amazing. So that was like a cool moment in the game. And that happened to Mark later where he, he had a reserve and had to roll a zero like across the map and he, he got me, you know, but I just thought, you know, range shovel attack. So it's, a lot of moments in the game are really cool and thematic. So I'm s- kind of sad it's over, but we decided we're going to jump right into battle of Britain start playing through that as a campaign um even though it's even though you have a campaign leg. in air quotes it's and like you have a leg up on them already little bit yeah we can play a few scenarios yeah. but that's yeah. awesome yeah or we may jump into memoir 44 i have campaign book volume two and uh, we can play a campaign in that one Nice. Like you've got a campaign night. It sounds like you've officially. This is what I <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it. It has been so much fun. And, and and what's cool about just getting together with one other person is coordinating schedules is a lot easier, right? Yeah. If you're trying to do a coordinate a campaign night with four people, it's like wow, we're all busy and it's tough to get a night, you know. So just having it with one other person is a lot easier. So we've been able to get through it in I don't know three or four months maybe. So that, I mean, that was awesome. So if you like uh, deck builders, you like World War II campaign games, no brainer. Go pick up Undaunted Undaunted Stalingrad. So I've been playing Normandy on Steam just against the computer, and that's been fun, but I would really like to get it back to the the table. I've got 
North Africa I still haven't finished. Logan and I haven't finished Battle of Britain scenarios, and we're still about halfway through Stalingrad. So Yeah, what's the scenario are you on in Stalingrad? Uh, think? Seven, I think. So nice. not quite halfway, I guess, but would love to get back to it. It it would be a great journey to go back there. Oh yeah. Or a great expedition. Oh, yes. Uh, so you're done, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have one more yes, game yes. that we're going to talk about. Uh, this is one that I got to the table again. We played it five player brand new a day or two after it showed up a month or so ago or a month or two ago. Uh, I got to play it again with Logan it is Expeditions. Uh, this is, a, of course, the sequel to Scythe from Jamie Stegmeier and Snowmeyer Games. Uh, it's got the amazing art from Jakob Rosalski, or Jacob Rosalski. Um, takes place after the Fenris campaign. A meteorite, or a meteor has crashed somewhere in Siberia. Some doctor dude goes after it. Nobody ever hears from him again. A search party is sent out. Nobody hears from them. So the heroes from the uh, war during Scythe are called upon and and go try to uh, find out what's going on. So this game is a table hog. There are, you know, 20-ish, 20-plus uh, hexa- hexagon tiles that are very large. And it when you lay them out, uh, it forms an inverted triangle where... At the bottom is your base camp, and that's where you start out from. And the first uh, row of tiles are all explored. Uh, This is a deck-building exploration game. Um, The second and third tier of tiles are not flipped over, but on each tile there are different actions that you can take when you do a gather action on that tile. So you have this big giant mech that you're moving around, doing actions uh, by gathering on these tiles and then you're going to new tiles and flipping them over and adding corruption uh, from the meteorite. Uh, There's corruption that's uh, polluting the land, right? Um, And these corruption tiles cover up some of the actions that are on these newly explored tiles. You're boasting as you accomplish different uh, goals, similar to in Scythe. Um, Instead of six stars, you're trying to get four. So when somebody does their fourth boast, I've got seven workers now. And that's exactly how it happens every single time somebody has to boast. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we totally every group does that. I I hope so because yeah, yeah. Uh, So anyway, when the when the fourth boast is done by someone. Everybody else gets one, or everybody gets one final turn, unlike in Scythe, where the game just immediately ends. And then whoever has the most points after you add up everything is the winner. Uh, I really like this game. Uh, so on your turn, you basically have three actions available to you. At the very least, you're always going to be doing two of them. The three available actions are move, which you can move your mech one to three spaces around the board. Um, you just can't end up in a space that someone else already is, has their mech there. You can play a card, uh, from your hand, which is really just to the left of your, uh, tableau, your little board. So you, those are the cards that are in your hand. And then the cards to your right are in your active row. And those are the cards that you've played. If you have a worker of the color of the card, you can get an additional ability when you play that card. You put the worker on the card. And, and then um, the third action that you can do is gather. I mentioned that when wherever your mech is, whatever actions are on the tile that he's on, he or she's on, uh, can you collect those resources or do the actions. Um, you can also refresh. Uh, so when you refresh, you pull all your active cards back to your hand and then you move your a little token on your board to the refresh spot. On your next turn, you're going to do all three of those actions, move, plan, and gather. If you're not refreshing, and on subsequent turns after that, you're going to move your little token onto one of those three choices, move, play, or gather. Whichever one it's on, you're going to do the other two actions. So if I cover up move, 
I'm going to play and play a card and gather on my next turn. I'm going to move it to play and I'm going to move and gather. So you're constantly choosing between which two actions you want to take, which is, I feel like pretty unique, or you're choosing to refresh and then get all your cards back and eventually take a full turn with all three actions. It's unique, but it's also got like, it's paying homage to Scythe. I feel like in that you have, unless you're playing as Rusvia in, in Scythe, you have the action token that you can only play one action at the same time. And I love that this game is unique. It's, it's not, it's, it's not, not Scythe. No, it's not, no, not at but all. it is, if you like Scythe, and you like it, it, it pays tribute to what Scythe did, and I love that about it. There's little things in there beyond just the artwork, like the artwork obviously and the max and, and the max, and it's beautiful. It is beautiful. But it, it, it like there are little things that yep. like no, throwbacks to Scythe. Well, oh, totally. Even even that it's maybe unnecessarily large. Right. Yeah. Like, because so Scythe is it. It was the first game that I got that had table presence, yes. right? It, and I got the extra board that you put the extension on there, and, and makes it all the just, hexagons bigger. Yeah, it makes all the hexes bigger, and it was like, whoa, this is cool. That this has the same feel, right? Because it's yeah. got the massive hexes, and it's it just has that table presence, which is cool. So I didn't mention this, but with how the the layout of the hexes is. There are open spots that cards fit into, and those are the available cards that you can draft. Um, and I think one of the reasons why they are so big is because those cards need, need to, to fit, fit exactly, in those yeah. open spots. And there could have been it, a different design to get maybe, you in a different yeah, spot. Yeah, right? yeah it yeah. could have. It it's could've. gimmicky in some ways, but I also think it adds character but, to the but game. But there are abilities that it's like draw uh, a card from anywhere or from an adjacent one that you're slot. next to yeah. yeah so whatever it's it covers the whole table we played a five-player game i have a very large table it barely fit uh i most recently played a two-player game and it still took up 80 percent of the table right so so i mean in the five-player game there was a pretty slow start to the game yeah pretty and slow it, and it was up. our first play for all of us and it, it was so so that's part of it right yeah but i think it may be, that's just kind of how the game is a little bit. How about, how was a two-player game? So right. a two-player, I thought it played really well. I, w I would prefer to play this at two and three-player, I think, going forward. Uh, the, the turns are very quick. I didn't feel like I was waiting very long for my turns. Logan was enthralled with the cards and the theme and the art and the, the words on the cards, right? So they have, the cards are quests and there's meteor cards and there's items and they, those are the cards that you collect and add to your hand. And then you can, in a f fashion or another, you upgrade all of them. You upgrade the items, you complete the quests. They f affect your end game scoring. Uh, the items that you upgrade are ongoing effects. And then the meteorites, uh, when you meld those, each time you meld a new one, you get the reward on the card that you just melded plus all the ones that you previously melded. Okay. And that reminded me of like 51st State in some ways, like the way that you're stacking these cards in different spots on your board and they're like playing off of each other when you're making a deal in 51st State or doing something else. Like that was, I, I liked that a lot because it does have this synergy with like building things and then you feel more powerful the more you do things. You do, but you also sacrifice some of those card abilities from no longer being in your hand when you meld them or upgrade them or complete the quests on them uh going back to your question i two and three player i think is the sweet spot for this game i don't know that i'd want to play a five player um there's not a ton of player interaction the inner the interactions especially at five player were oh kevin and tyson are in two of the spots that i wanted to go to i can't go there right so there's a little bit less of that at, at two player obviously uh, but the game was really fun and, and I really enjoyed it. I love the choices of when do I upgrade or meld or complete this quest and give up this card's ability to do that. Um, you know, just trying to balance moving around and, and exploring, flipping over new tiles, doing finding the right sequence of events is a puzzle that I still have not even begun to unfold. That so. sequence of events is like, to me, it's deck building, right? Because like essentially what you have, it, it's, it's a fresh new take on deck building in a way that I haven't seen before in that you have 
all of your cards splayed out for everybody to see. So your deck is no secret to anybody. Right. But I love that whole uh, refresh kind of mechanic. And I loved figuring out where do I want to play it and when do I want it on a certain side of my board and and, and how does it go. It was... I want to play this game more. The more after we played it, we did have a little bit of a long play with, at five players, and I I agree I that understood. like my perspective was like um, probably similar to what you're saying here, Tyler. Is that that lower player count maybe where this shines? Um, and I'd love to play that more to find out. But even at five players, even though it did kind of overstates it, welcome maybe a little bit, but not like to me, I enjoyed every part of it. I saw a lot of potential and I want to be playing this one more. Yeah. So, uh, you, you don't own this, right? I do not. Tyson. Um, do you think you're going to get it? No, because I don't think that I'll be able to play it enough, unfortunately. And Tyler has a copy. And yeah, I, I feel the same way. I don't. I don't think I'm going to pick this one up because I, I would want the Ironclad edition that has right. everything. And yeah, I don't want. I mean, Tyler's got it. And I don't think like I, I agree with the the player count thing. How long of a, a play is it with two? So it was Logan's first game. We played in an hour and a half. So hour and, a half. And, okay. and you know, it was the school night. I'm like, okay, we got to hurry up a little bit just so you can get to bed at a reasonable time. He could not like soak up the theme enough. He, he wanted to read every card that came up and like, Oh, this one goes with that one. And you know, the cards tie into the locations. They're uniquely numbered and named. And so it was a little he bit was, of a he longer was, play than it probably could, he was, should have he been. was soaking that up as much as possible, which is awesome because sure. the theme is, is definitely a, a high point of, of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I, I, would, I liked it. I like to play. If it, if we were playing four player with people who had played it a few times and it wasn't a new play for anybody, I think it could still hold up at four yeah. or five. It, might it's still the be. old argument. If you play this more than once, <laughs> sure. we can get this play time but, down. But, but yeah, two and three player, this game is, I really enjoy it. I don't think it's comparable to Scythe. I think there are two different types of games, but well, I, this is the kind of sequel that I want. Though. Yes. I, and I wanted to talk about that. Like, Dune Imperium. I'm still not sure how I feel about the Dune Imperium Uprising. Because it's, it's slightly, the same game. It's just, yeah, it's slightly changed. There's going to be new cards and different board locations, but it's still essentially the same game, let, at least like, on the surface. Come out with something you can explore for the first time. Right. Right? Well, yeah. and, and it should be noted, I I think what you're referencing here, Tyler, is I mean, I'm still going to buy it. We have a, we on our well, Discord, course, yeah. we do a question of the week. Uh, and one of the questions that we had recently was uh, in regards to sequel games. Like, what game would you want to be a sequel game? And then we had this long conversation about what is a sequel game and what do we want out of a sequel game and things. And I agree that like, I don't want like a reprinting of a game if that's what we're calling a sequel Generally, game. Generally, right. Right. I, I don't want like an updated version that does the same thing, but maybe slightly better, thereby invalidating my old version. Right. It feels I, like a cash grab at that point. Yeah. Uh, what yeah. I want is... Especially if you've upgraded stuff. Yeah. This was a perfect example of like what I want out of a sequel game is that... Like like we already talked about, they they throw they have a a number of throwbacks in expeditions that make you think of Scythe both graphically and mechanically right. in a way that like you know the parentage of this game, right? But it is it is its own thing, and there's no reason you couldn't own both games and get enjoyment out of both games, right? Yeah, it's it's in that same world, but it's got different things. There are some nods to Scythe, but in no way do I feel like I'm playing Scythe or replacing Scythe or even trying to replace Scythe with this game. No, and going back to your Kevin, your question, Kevin, about would I personally buy this? If I weren't where I am in my gaming career, I uh, like if five years He's a ago professional. <laughs> are, are, are you going you on tour or something? Like, what's happening here? It? My g gaming life? I don't know. Whatever. If I weren't where I am now, uh, five years ago, I would have bought this. Like, no questions, even though Tyler has a copy. But because I feel like I've become more selective and less interested in buying duplicate copies of the same games because I can get them experienced... Um, still, I think that's the only reason that's holding me back. If I had played this and neither of you owned a copy, I would be picking this up. Yeah. I mean, I have this weight of game, a lot of them at my house already. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, and I don't think I would get a lot of play with my family necessarily. Right. So, yeah, that for those reasons, not not a desire to really pick this one up if we have a copy of it in the group. So glad you picked it up, Tyler. Yeah, continue I, to I, buy I, games. I That's am, what I'm saying. I'm very happy that I own this and. Uh, I'm looking forward to future plays because I feel like I've just scratched the surface with some of the synergies and chaining of actions and, and, you know, I just feel like there's so much more to explore. They're clearly going to do an expansion for it. There's spots there's in the spot box in there, yeah. <laughs> for additional. <laughs> and it's Stonemeyer, So of course, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that whenever that happens. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I think that wraps up what we've been playing lately. Uh, Should we move into our mainstay feature of this episode and talk about Essen games? I think we should. I'm okay with that, yeah. All right, cool, let's do it. Unless you want to talk more about Vienna sausages. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) Why do you have to bring that up again? (laughs) I was trying to find a game that had the city of Vienna that I could have Or sausages. Yeah, it's it's (laughs) Unconscious Mind. There you go. Oh, are you going to... I've got that one on the way. Nice. Okay. All right. So Essen is happening October 5th through the 8th. Nice. Okay. This episode will probably drop on September 25th. So a week or two, a couple weeks before Essen. So we're not going to Essen, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, We wanted to highlight some of the games that we're excited about that are coming out of Essen. I don't know about you guys. I went through the entire list on BGG. I ignored a lot of things that I either already saw or already knew a lot about uh, from Origins or Gen Con or otherwise. So I, I kind of went the route of picking games that I didn't know a lot about. I, I picked <laughs> games that I was excited about and I would probably buy if I went. Um, nice. And I, I maybe heard about a few of these before, but I kind of I skipped games that I saw at uh, Gen Con. If it if it was available for sale at Gen Con, I did not select it. So I tried to pick games that were new to Essen. Yeah, similarly, if if I hadn't heard about it from Gen Con or Origins, and or I hadn't seen it on those lists, I kind of I excluded anything that I had seen, but. I'm most of my list was stuff that was going to be released either at Essen or third quarter, late third quarter, um, 2023. So some of this may be available now, but it's just barely recently available. And now you can pick it up at Essen. Nice. Cool. Who's starting? I'll start. Okay. okay I'm still thought. trying to decide what my number five is. So, Oh, Let's I'll go, go after Tyson. you. Yeah. Okay. And I'll, but I'll, I'll listen. I will, sure, sure. I will yes. pay attention. Yeah, we know that you're very attentive at all times. Whatever, Kevin. <laughs> My, the first game I want to talk about that I'm excited coming out of Essen is a game from Portal Games, who is a publisher that I really enjoy, and they constantly bring out good stuff. Um, this is a game designed by Tim Armstrong, uh, and the art is bu- done by Hannah Kuik, and it's Imperial miners which may sound familiar coming from portal games they already have imperial settlers which coincidentally is uh similar in a lot of ways to one of our state 51st state exactly so immediately that like hopped onto my radar because i love 51st state we've played it a lot so far and i am not sick of it i want to play more of it but i never really wanted to play imperial settlers because it was one so similar to uh, 51st State, but I preferred the theme of 51st State more. Uh, and and they, the, there was just a little bit less of an appeal to me of Imperial Settlers. But after playing 51st State, I've always thought, oh, it would be interesting to go see what the difference is between Imperial Settlers and 51st State are. But I still haven't done that. But this intrigues me because it is within that world of uh, Imperial Settlers, but it's specifically the Miners. This is a um, a a chaining style game is how they're classifying it. Hand management with simultaneous action selection uh, where players are creating their own minds by playing cards into their own personal tableau area. And... They start from the surface and develop downward, which is interesting knowing 51st State, how that works, how your tableau is growing. But this one has a leveling kind of an experience going on with it. Uh, 
there's a lot of different things. This one plays in a relatively short play time. They're saying 20 to 60 minutes. So that caught my eye as maybe I'm not as interested in Imperial Settlers because that plays at, a, at the same play time as 51st State. But this kind of quicker game might be interesting. It also plays at up to five players, which is always a good per- bonus for me. And honestly, the look of this one, I prefer the look of this one to Imperial Settlers. I think the colors, the palette that they're using is kind of these neon colors, uh, pinks and greens and blues and and yellows and things like that, that I really like. Uh, and I like the, uh, the resources and kind of um, the aesthetic that this game has to offer. So I'm interested in this one a lot. I don't know. I obviously haven't played this. I would... I'm keeping my eye out on it. I'm subscribed to it on BGG, so I'm getting all the notices and up, updates of all the new photos and things that are going on. And it's one that I'm I'm definitely going to be keeping my eye out for. Looks pretty. I like the gems. They look awesome. Yeah, I like it. I want to play this one. It seems it's shorter playtime. Looks kind of... That, exactly. That's a, that's it might a, hit that's the sweet spot. It could hit the sweet spot. Engine Builder. I love Engine Builder, so... Cool. I like it. Yeah. So that's Imperial Miners. All right. So my first game, this is actually a reprint of a game that came out in 2009 that I've had on my radar for a long time because of the designer. And that is Vladimir Suhi. So this is a reprint of Shipyard. So this is Shipyard second edition. Uh, It is published by Delicious Games Um, and Art. Okay. It's Michael Rez. Resnick and Adela Stopka. I'm so sorry. Got those horribly wrong. I'm, I'm sure. sure. You it. I'm sure. I, I'm sure I know it. So shipyard. This is one of the earlier designs from Vladimir Suhi. Uh, in this game, um, you're in the 19th century and you are building a ship, uh, and you're adding all kinds of different things to this ship. The the coolest thing about this game, um, as I was doing some research on it, is that it's got five rondelles. Five rondelles. <laughs> you heard me right. Not just one, but five. So if you like rondelles, this may be... Here you go. Yeah, <laughs> this may be the game for you. And some of my favorite games have rondelles, right? Like Teo Tawakan is one of my all-time favorites. Uh, it's basically just a big rondelle, right? So that immediately intrigued me along obviously with the designer. Um, you're building the ship. Like I mentioned, you have different segments of the ship. Uh, you can put, you got to put a captain on the ship. You can put uh, a propeller, you can put a mast, you can put sto- smokestacks. Um, there is points that you score based on how you build your ship. So there's long-term planning. Um, there's got to be something in there like all other Suki games that is a mechanic that's unique and interesting. Yeah. I'm excited to play and find out what that is. Maybe it's just having five rondelles. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I like the rondelles in uh, Praga, for example. He implemented that great. That's, that's probably, exactly what I was thinking. It's probably my favorite part of that game is the rondelle and the crane action. You know, So, um, yeah, excited to get it played. I will definitely be picking this up when it's readily available here in the States. So. And they updated the, the the look of this one a lot, and yes. I think they have done a really good job. Whereas Shipyard before the first edition was not a looker; it wasn't. One it was that not I a was looker, in, yeah. But they did a good job at drawing you in with this one. I think. Yeah the 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 art is is done really well for sure. Yeah, it looks a lot better than the original. So, which you would hope that it would being a second right. edition, right? I don't understand when games do a second edition and like just recycle all the crap yeah. and the same stuff. Yeah. I I mean like Terraforming Mars is an example of this for me. It's like and they haven't done a quote unquote second edition, but Well, they did that big box that's pretty crazy. They did. But they didn't upgrade But they the didn't art. do like a facelift on this game, which I think it was its its weakest point. I want to <laughs> You see... don't you don't like the clip art no, that right. they have on all the cards? Do their own. <laughs> it's not my favorite. No. And I, I get that art is expensive. I, and that's there's tons of yes. it in yes. Terraforming Mars. But like with how successful that one's been. I want like I want a revised like beautified version of that. I think I'm sure great. their uh, their AI engines are busy at work. <laughs> <laughs> Not to go there, but uh, you went there. You yeah. went there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, my number five. I I'm going to talk about the only expansion on my list, and uh, I was trying to choose between two of them. Uh, I 
was going to pick Batoku's expansion. There's not a lot of information available for that one. I know it adds a few modules and some new cards and uh, things. I actually posted on the forum, hey, is there any additional information? And it looks like there was a response last night saying, thanks for asking. They'll post, we'll post them early I next week. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So uh, yeah. not a lot of the information there. I'm going to go a different direction. And this one I was really excited about. Not so excited about, and now I'm really excited about again. Uh, Kevin just talked about a uh, Vladimir Suhi game. One of his games that I've played that I enjoy is Messina 1347, um, you know, the Black Plague. I'm going to go to another Black Plague experience with the Plague or Leon expansion. Uh, so I've been looking at this one, and I've flip flop a little bit on how excited I am, but I think I'm really excited about it. I wondered, it. because you did say, that you explained a couple of things, and I'm sure you're going to get into it, but like, I, I thought you were out on this one. I, w- I was, but reading it again, I'm like, oh, this kind of looks awesome. So one of the things that we love about Orleone as a bag builder is that regardless of what you pull out of the bag you generally have somewhere to put those tokens and do something rewarding with it. It may not be your favorite thing, but you can always do something. Yeah. So in this updated uh, expansion, which honestly I'm happy that Reiner Stockhausen is uh, doing more expansions for, uh, and this one makes the game a little bit more difficult. So you have these new corpse tokens because, you know, it's the plague and people are dying. Uh, there are new hourglass tiles that control the the round action um, that you flip over for each round. And some of those, or maybe all of them, tell you how many corpse tokens to add to your bag. So when you draw corpse tokens, you can't use them. So maybe that won't be as fun because it feels bad. Well, it's a dead chip. But it's <laughs> oh, okay. but it, it's thematic, and there are some other things you have. There's they're also adding in plague doctors that are kind of like a wild card action that you can do, or I mean, use as any of your other workers uh, once per round. There's some new there's an, some new uh, location cards that you can get. Um, there's a new beneficial deeds board. I don't know. I. I'm excited about this. I'm going to get it for sure. I've got all the other uh, base Orleone games and expansion game and expansions. Um, there's, there's also some plague cards. I didn't get to what those actually do, uh, but it looks awesome. I'm oh, having yeah. Wonderland's war flashbacks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I want to play this expansion. Well, so, and I think maybe there's way to ways to mitigate the, some of the corpses. I don't know if there is or not. When you draw them out and add them to your market, you can always at the end of the round, put them back into your bag so that you're not taking up spots in your, your eight spot market or whatever it is. So I don't know. I, I'm definitely excited about it. I'm still going to get it no matter what. I was just wavering on whether or not it was going to beat out Batoku for my uh, fifth spot on this list. See, and I, I, I'm, I'm happy that you're excited about it and you'll be getting it because I'm interested in trying it because I love Orleans and I'm happy for more content for Orleans. But I don't know that uh, I'm. I have that trepidation that you already described and that Kevin alluded to with Wonderland's War. Uh, that I. I don't know that I love the feel bad potential that it could I, exist. I don't want to pull crap out of the bag. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't know, it, it, but uh, it could be, but it could be awesome. Specifically though, for me in Orleone, because I, we've commented on this podcast multiple times about how it is the standard, I think by which bag builders should be created. Yes. And, yeah. and that is one of the things that we've specifically highlighted. I'm trepidatious at, at best saying that I think that this could be a, it could violate the principal rules that we yeah, like could. that we think yeah. that we could it hate great. it and never play it again. Yeah. But but then again, I need to add another plague game to my collection. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. The, the I'm only, torn as well. The, the only thing with this is I've got the upgraded tokens from BGG. 
Oh, oh, does this have those yet? I don't probably think not so. Yet. And I they pr- probably. And uh, I would it... have to look pretty hard to find my uh, cardboard tokens. I think they're in one of these bins, but I'm not sure. So, oh, that's almost a deal breaker right there. It is because you can't mix and match. Well, and no. do you if ever want to play Orleon without those? Right? No, I mean, no. not really. It, so it adds to the maybe experience. Maybe I'll wait until I they... never bought those. So, I mean, if you want to play I... with my copy, but, but, they'll, but they'll get those. The yeah, geek I, up I think they would add them. They'll, they'll add them. I can't imagine they wouldn't. Yeah. So I, I didn't buy them either. You were gifted them, right? Ben gave them to me. Yeah. Oh so. well, yeah. Have Ben buy them for you. Yeah. yeah when they that, oh, yeah. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ben. Uh, Your gift is uh, no longer it, valid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put me in a, a troubled spot, yeah. Ben. Did you hear what just came out? <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink. Hint, hint. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is Orléon uh, the Plague. Are, are we only on five? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go. So let's, let's go to four. Out, let's go right? to four. Let's speed this up a minute. Number yeah. four for me is the uh, start of a trend that you'll see shortly by a designer that I really like. This is a game that is designed by Yaniv Kahana, Simone Luciani, and Pini Schichter. Um, It's published by Fractal Juegos, and it's called Sea Dragons. Uh, So obviously one of the big appeals to me here was I saw uh, Simone Luciani's name on it. But even before that, it's got this interesting color palette that the box just stood out to me. And I was like, okay, well, that looks interesting. That looks great. And then I noticed, hey, Simone Luciani's name is on this. That means that you have my attention. Essentially what Sea Dragons is, is this is a two to five player game in which each player plays as a sea dragon or sea dragons. Uh, And you are trying to do this area control type of a thing with a... Basically, a grid board with like four main sections. Uh, you're trying to expand and and grow and put your sea dragon on this grid. And there are little meeple pieces that have like the sea dragon's head and then its spine, its tail and stuff. And like, so you can grow the length of your sea dragon and do all of this stuff. It is interesting looking and it has like table presence that makes me very curious about is this like a snake game that's what i'm wondering is like does it have like the the snake chasing the apple like app game that you played right and you eat more apples and it grows bigger and bigger i'm not entirely certain to be honest i read the description there's no videos on this one so i didn't get a ton of information on it but essentially what it says in the description is each turn one of you're going to uh, get pattern cards and each turn one of the two pattern cards that from your hand will be played to a position on a sea dragon on the board, increasing your presence in all four kingdoms. Hmm. So to me, it sounds like uh, almost like a choir-esque in some ways is that you have these cards that you can play that is going to correspond with spaces on the board that you can grow your dragon and you can maybe it has this uh, snake kind of vibe to it. I don't know. But again... It's got Simone Luciani's name on it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a chance, say that or... that's worth giving it a chance. And its table presence alone looks like something that I want to experience. This one, yeah, and the art is a very unique style. Yes, the, and the cover. I looked at the cover and was like, I know I've seen this guy's work before, and it's the guy that's done like the Bloody Inn, uh, oh, Avalon yeah. Big Box, okay. very unique style. It nice. is yeah. absolutely, he, and he's done tons of other stuff too. But uh, those are the he ones did that I was the thinking. great split. He did, he which did. is uh, oh, we just, talk, the, we just, we talked, just about talked about this in the last episode. Yeah, yeah. so that is uh, oh. Weberson Santiago. The art that he did that is one of my favorite is World Championship Russian Roulette. He did the oh. art. Oh that yeah, as he well. did. He did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I, yeah, that's a good call. I, he is very unique art, and I, I like what I see here. Cool. So yeah, that's Sea Dragons. All right, so my number four. um, Wow, I could do a dragons uh, transition. Transition, and I just I just blew it. it. (laughs) I just blew it. Ah, all right. So I mean, I can edit that out. No, no, it's fine. No transition for me. But uh, this game is called Zango Zango Gu Zhangwa Zhang Zhangwa. Yes. We'll go with that. Something like that. This this one is um, 
wow, I'm picking another re-implementation or reprint here. This, uh, this game came out, um, I believe, in 2014. And it's actually a game I've played one time before. Uh, and it's been a long time since I played this. But I remember really enjoying it. And I remember it had a lot of interesting things going on. So in this game, um, the so-called warring states are brought together in China. And um, reading from the BGG page, it says in Zen, in Zen how, how's that again? Uh, I'm going to say Zhang Wu. Okay. In that, the first empire, you go along with the emperor's plans to offer your family a place in the terracotta army. All right. So that's kind of the theme of the game and where it's coming from. What I remember liking about this game is the card play is super interesting, right? So you have these cards and on the cards, there is, you can do two things with them. You can play them on your player board and there are um, things that you can get on the top of the card when you take certain actions, or you can play these cards on the main board. And on the main board, there are other actions that you can take, but it depends on the value of the card. So to start the round, you take two cards from each available stack. And on these stacks, uh, there's numbers on the cards from like one to 20 and then 21 to 40 and then, uh, you know, 40 to 60. Or uh, I think the ranges are a little bit higher than that, but you get a distribution of numbers in your hand. If you play a card that has a higher number than what's currently on the stack, you get to take an action and get a bonus for that action. Um, if And then there's two spots, whereas if you play a card that has a lower number than what's currently on the stack, you get to take that action and get a bonus for that action. So it makes for some really interesting decisions. Am I going to play this card on my board? Am I going to play it on the main board? Um, Am I going to play a really high card? Am I going to play a card that's barely above that number? I just remember there was a lot of cool and interesting decisions there. Um, you can go onto the board and build the wall. You can build palaces. You can put governors out on the building. There's sections of the board where long-term planning, you know, it's a variable kind of things that you work towards that uh, are variable for every game. It's just random what gets put out. Um, I don't know. I just thought it was a really fun game when I played it before. I've had my eye on it forever. It's been out of print. I think What's Your Game published it initially. Um, let's see. Let me see who publishes it now. Uh, publisher, sorry, we, sorry are we are French, is publishing it now. Uh, the designer is Marco Canetta and Steph Stefania Nicolini. And art by Ulrich Mays and David Sitbon. Um, so yeah, super excited for this one. I Probably will be picking this one up at some point. Uh, that is Zhang Guo. Oh, I, I got a pronunciation. Okay. Zhang Guo. Nice. That's this game. Zhang Guo. The First Empire. My number four. How dare you? That's my next game. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my next game is How Dare You. Uh, this is, you know, we went to Gen Con, right? And some of the we, we did our favorite games coming out of Gen Con were lighter weight uh, games that we played while we were there. Bonsai comes to mind. Bonsai, Inside Job, Inside Job. Yeah, uh, there were a number of games. So, sea Salt the, and Paper, Sea Salt and Paper, The Great Split. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some fantastic games. So I'm I'm going with a lighter weight game for my number four. It's called How Dare You, and it's a party game. Uh, and in this game, there are a number of cards and you pick a number and then you fl look at the card and you read that question and you make a guess. Okay. So like one of the questions for the solar system card is number of earths that could fit into Jupiter. Okay. So you, you make a guess and they're all, they're always going to be numerical guesses. Okay. And then the next person's going to make a guess, and it has to be larger than the previous guess. And at a certain point, somebody's going to say a number that the next person thinks is too high, and they're going to dare and challenge that answer. How dare you? Right. And then there's double dares and doubling of points. But what happens when double somebody... Double dares? B yes. Okay, got it. Yes. Uh, double duck dares. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so when you challenge and, and dare... If you are right and that the previous person's guess is over the answer, then they get stuck with the card. If you're wrong and their answer is still below the, the actual number, then you get stuck with a card. At a certain point in the game, either by the end of the 10 rounds or uh, when 
um, based on the player count. A player has too many cards. Uh, you count up all the duck heads that are on your cards that you've collected over the course of the game. You don't want ducks. Whoever has the most... Why, why ducks? I, I, uh, I'd have to go back and, and find that out. Okay, uh, not important. Yep. Uh, Donald Duck now starts to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So uh, whoever has the most duck heads or whatever... Uh, lose, Severed duck heads. <laughs> loses the game. And everybody I else it. wins. I, if oh, I, I love those games. Yeah. 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 yeah like, uh, like cockroach like, poker. Like yeah. poker yeah. When yeah. Tyson like lost, he was the loser three, three games in a row. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. It was. Okay. So it's, it's a fun little trivia, a spin on a trivia game. I think it looks really fun. This is by, uh, alien by Dr. Zero, Dr. O Christian Ospi, who also designed games such as revive Santa Maria and escape. Oh, um, I will say under a porta. I, I opened up the BGG page and looked at the box art and I, I I'm a little frightened. Yeah. Like, uh, are they, are they beaver people? I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know it's what's interesting. going on. It's an interesting couple that is on the, uh, yeah. the art and her, how her what, hands are. What are what's, what's wrong with on. their hands? Yeah. Uh, the, the designer is Rodrigo Rego and the artist is Guillermo Monet. Guillermo has a, he has an interesting art style. I, I, I mean, I, I like it, but so, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, this is by the same designer as Savernaki Forest or, oh, oh, yeah. or Savernake Forest, whatever another, it was, by Devere Games. Another um, simple game that we enjoyed coming out of Gen Con. Yep. I saw the title. I see the cover art. Not something I would have ever thought, yeah, that's something I'd be interested in. But after your description, <laughs> I am like interested in in, the, in, in experiencing it. Yeah. Even the little, um, you have numbers rise. Everybody gives a number. And then once it gets too high, somebody has to say, how dare you? That reminds me a little bit of a skull of how high do I, do I want to make this go before I have to say, how dare you in this one? I, there's a lot of potential fun in this one i could see that tyler digging deep for a diamond in the rough so yeah well and when someone dares you if you know you're right you can double dare them and challenge their dare layers and then they have a choice to back out or if they're wrong they'll take two cards so yeah no i like trivia games like i grew up playing tons of trivial pursuit i I think this is a interesting little twist that no, absolutely. plays up to 10 players, 15, 20 minutes. I, I'm going to get this game for sure. That was my number four. How dare you? Well, how dare I indeed, because I'm choosing another Simone Luciani title here for, <sighs> for my next game. I think I know which one it is. Do you? Because it's in the spreadsheet. So well, I mean, you should probably be able to. See I, that. I almost. Well, you've been picking them out of order, so. No, I just rearranged it. So you did, he yeah, just yeah. rearranged it. I thought. Oh no, it's not. You have three Simone I Luciani have three games. Three Simone Luciani. Yes, yes. Spoiler yeah. alert. This is not the one I was thinking of picking. I was thinking of picking your other one. Yeah, yeah. So this one, this is. Anunnaki, Dawn of the Gods. It's designed by Simone Luciani and Danilo Sabia. Uh, and I'd heard of this game. It was on Kickstarter a while back. It's now going to be released officially uh, at Essen. And it's a game that uh, at first on Kickstarter, I remember hearing about it and seeing it and thinking, nah, that's not really something that, that really intrigues me or interests me. But I didn't realize at the time that it was Simone Luciani and I'm... Obviously, I've already talked about Simone Luciani in this episode. I really enjoy what he's doing. And so even though I wasn't immediately drawn to this one on Kickstarter, I'm now more interested in it. Essentially, what this is, is you are an ancient alien civilization leaving your dying planet. And the weird thing about this to me is that your ancient alien civilization also seemed to be um, like Greek gods atlantean gods a bunch of random like mythology types of things and so it's it's pulling in this like sci-fi and mythology kind of tie to it that makes it and that's honestly part of it was when i originally heard about this was kind of what threw me off i was like that's kind of goofy feeling in some ways but essentially this is a 4x euro game um 
where you're it's set in an ancient dystopian past it says where mythology and science fiction come together uh essentially what you're doing is it's a 4x style game and i've been looking lately for a 4x style game that plays in two hours that plays in two hours that's exactly crazy exactly that so yeah. it says 60 to 120 minutes on the bgg page you play with the same group you could probably get that down to an hour and a half right yeah. there was one that i saw i don't remember what it was but 4x in an hour Ooh. I almost had it on my list, but I don't remember what it is anymore. See, but I've been looking for one that plays in about this <laughs> time you. frame. Thank you, Tyler. Is and maybe this is it. Leftovers? <laughs> <laughs> this could be the 4X that plays in the time frame that I'm looking for. And so it's by a trusted designer. It's one that I have a lot of interest in. It's a little bit interesting in its presentation, I think. I don't know that I love the aesthetic all that much. But when you look at the... Uh, the the player boards it actually reminds me of you kevin already mentioned uh vladimir suhi and um the messina it reminds me of a little bit of the messina boards in in how it's laid out with your player estates and things like that but i read a little bit about this and if you go along these circular tracks on your player board you can start putting these cubes in your board similar to uh messina i think in that you unlock certain abilities that now you can take a unit once you've surrounded a specific icon on your board and you can take that unit and deploy it and put it somewhere else replacing a different unit that was already existing and this is a minor god as i understand it that has alternate abilities so it's got some potential like blood ragey kind of a uh, vibes to it in some ways but in a euroy kind of style so i don't know this one uh i i'm interested in i would like more information on it and I'm, I'm gonna watch some more reviews and things of this one see some gameplay uh and and it might I'm be really excited to play your copy yeah yeah i am very excited i remember when this was on kickstarter and it looked interesting but it was a pass for me at the time I love, I mean, I love sci-fi space theme stuff. This has some of that. <laughs> so is it, is it Tony on Secret Cabal that's always getting crap for yeah, the, his it, it Anunnaki is. beliefs? It absolutely is. Oh, yeah, 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 I think so. I think so. And that's part of where I heard originally about this one. And so I was, and, and I was not at all interested in it at that time, but it's, it's, it's similar to your Orleans kind of uh, plague stuff going on where it's growing on me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Nice. I like it. So that's my number three, Anunnaki, Dawn of the Gods. We're almost halfway. Okay. We're almost there. Almost there. Uh, I'll forgo the transition just to speed us up. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Cool. All right. Um, so my game is Evanfall. Okay. This is designed by Stefano Di Silvio, art done by Martin, Martin Motet, published by DLP Games. So um, in this one, I believe you're uh, a coven of witches. Um, this is a card engine builder. Sign me up. I love card games. I love engine builders. It's got worker placement. This has asymmetric powers. Tyler, right? Uh -huh. All on board with that. Um, I watched a video uh, today of this one, and they said the player abilities are so powerful. It's one of those games where you have an ability, and you're like, this is amazing. And then you look at everybody else around the table, and it's like, your power is amazing. Your power is amazing. So it's like it's, Marco Polo. like we it, Right, like you guys about. were talking about Marco Polo. This, this uh, seems like it has kind of a similar vibe as far as that goes with your asymmetric powers. Um, the art on this looks amazing. I love the art style. I think it looks really good. Um, that was the first thing that drew my attention on this one was that box cover is just, it kind of speaks to you and the, the right. look at me kind of a thing. Yeah, it really draws you in. And then you look at the cards and the card, uh, the art itself in the game. It's not just a pretty box. It's got like other cool art that's in it as well. It's got multi-use cards. Again, sign me up. I love multi-use cards. Um, it, a lot of witch games coming out lately. Yeah, you got Septima coming out. and uh, Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Witchcraft and... Uh, Hey, there you go. There's Maybe. two. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's uh, now three. No, three. 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 <laughs> now three. That's actually. Witches Brew. Wi that oh, that came out a while ago. Just coming out. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So this game, looking at it, it looks very similar to 51st State as far as it, how it's laid out. You have this uh, player board um, that has, I think, some your asymmetric powers on it. And then you are going to line up cards uh, next to your player board. And I think you know the top cards, you can get resources from those. And then through game effects, you can move those cards down and they do different things. Um, Obviously, I don't know exactly how to play, but uh, it looked like it was doing some really interesting things. Um, I also like the fact that as you get cards down in your tableau, you can take actions on those cards. I love games that where you're building your own thing and you can take actions with what you have built that nobody else has access to. I think that's fantastic. It seems like this game does that. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited for it. A uh, little bit worried that... I think there's a lot going on once you start building your tableau and keeping track of everything. Um, maybe well, a little bit tricky at first, but as you play more, it probably is, it becomes a little bit easier. That was one it. of my red flags. So this was on my list as well. It was either between Sea Dragons or this that I, I was trying to figure out which one I wanted to put on my uh, on my list more. Um, sea Dragons ultimately won out, but this was a very close second with that. Uh, the one thing that I did notice, though, that kind of maybe was a little red flag for me potentially was that the cards are very text heavy in a lot of the cards. And so I that whole keeping track of things, it was something that I was a little bit worried about. But everything that you talked about, Kevin, in regards to this game and what it's doing were the exact reasons why this was high on my list and why it's one that I'm very interested in hearing. Learning more about checking out would love to get this played if I, I get the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me, it's a completely different game, but like Underwater Cities, or even we talked about yeah. um, uh, the Terraforming Mars, that's got tons of cards with a lot of text and a lot of things to keep track of. So it's it's one of those games you can't just play casually, right? It's gonna, you're gonna have to be really invested in it when you're playing, It's it seems like anyway. So uh, looks good. I would definitely like to play this one maybe try before you buy type of thing. But, yeah. um, but it looks very interesting to me. So that's my number three, Evan Fall. All right, so I went with another lightweight game for my number three. This game might be terrible, I don't know, but uh, it caught my eye. It is a trick-taking game from Jolly Dutch Productions. It is called Tricky Badger. And uh, the one-liner for the game is collect and protect wild hamsters while keeping them away from hungry badgers. It's got a big badger on the front of the cover uh, with hamsters running away. Uh, something. So if that doesn't try it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I like the art of it. Uh, the art. It actually is yeah, a it looks really good. well done art for, for what the name suggests and what the game plays. One suggests. of the best badgers I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah. So uh, th it, it's designed by... Alexander Napkins and the artist is Zenia Leopinia. I apologize. Um, it is so it's a trick taking game. It has an interesting take on it. So you got your standard, well, somewhat standard four suits of regular cards, one through 11. Then you have a trump suit, which is, I believe, one through seven. Um, something that I thought was interesting is some of the cards cancel out other cards specifically. So like a five tr of one color might cancel out the trump of the seven, uh, even though it's a lower number, it might cancel it out. That was something interesting. But the thing that I like most, or that I think is very interesting about this is, uh, each round you're dealt nine cards each player's dealt nine cards and then there's 10 collection cards that are added to the table and you're trying to collect sets of cards um, that play off of each other as far as points and those are kind of determined by the collection cards and some of the collection cards are negative some of them are positive uh, so whoever is the first player of a trick they will pick whichever collection card everybody is playing for, for that trick. Um, and some of them will say, you know, if the lowest card wins this trick and this card, and some of them will be the higher, highest value card played will win this, this card and, and whatever it's positive or negative scoring uh, conditions are. So you're collecting these collection cards 
uh, over the course of the game, a, a few rounds, I think, um, three or four rounds. Um, and I just thought it was an interesting take on a trick taking game. Uh, I did think it was funny. So like you get bonus points if you, uh, have a female and a male hamster, but if you have a second male hamster, they fight each other and kill each other or something, and you don't score any points for them. So uh, I thought that was interesting, partially because as a kid, I had a hamster. They were angry hamsters. And my brother had a hamster. And at one point, we didn't have enough stuff to keep them in separate cages. And, uh, you know, the the wood chips or whatever you put in the bottom. And I was like six at the time. And I remember they got put in the same cage and I came back to my room. We shared a room. Uh, I came back to the room and my hamster was dead and, and its head had been like deferred. Like there, it was, it was dead. The other hamster killed it. My brother's hamster. And he thought that was hilarious I've always, I've never forgotten that. I can still picture this the, is a terrible the, story. The, the, the <laughs> hamster. So there, there is some dark. truth to male hamsters taking each other out. I mean, <laughs> I mean it brings Tyler back to his childhood. Oh so uh, this is uh, Matt and Vienna sausages. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jolly Dutch Productions. I assume this is a Dutch publisher. They actually had a couple other games that I was interested in. Um, I ended up picking this one, but there was also Synergy and Odd Shop, which had an interesting uh, auction mechanic where you were going for relics, but they might have been uh, fakes. So they score differently depending on whether it's a real item or a fake one. Anyway, definitely going to check this out at some point. It might not be great, but I thought it was an interesting twist on trick-taking. I thought when you said trick-taking, you were going to go with Dracula versus Van Helsing. As I, I thought about that one. Uh, we tried that out on BGA. I didn't know the full rules. Same. Uh, it's definitely one I want to go back to and try on BGA. That almost made my list, but uh, didn't quite. I would agree, but that one is specifically a two-player game. And as far as trick-taking goes... I like the two-player trick-taking games for the most part, but I think I'd see a lot more traction with Tricky Badgers, uh, and I like the idea of those collection cards. Uh, I think that it, with, with the, every new trick-taking game, you got to see what's the twist, what's the... Right. What's the There's got to be thing, something right? unique. Oh, I don't want to win this collection card. Those collection cards sound really interesting. Yeah, I, it's, it's kind of... Inside Job does this a little bit when you don't want to necessarily win right. a trick, right? So it seems like it adds that element, at least from time to time. Three to five players from Jolly Dutch Productions. Check it out. Tricky Badger. So my next game is also of the Animal Kingdom here. It is a game called Rats of Wistar. Uh, and this is a game that is... Oh, surprise! Designed by Simone Luciani uh, and oh my gosh. <laughs> Danilo Sabia. Uh, so you'll know th notice that Simone Luciani and Danilo Sabia were the ones who just designed uh, Anunnaki, Dawn of Gods. This game is a completely different vibe entirely than Anunnaki was in that you're playing this game as one of four rats who organized the escape from the famous Wistar Institute. This sounds like Rats of Nim to me. Yeah, absolutely. Right? I, and I was going to ask was if that was before your time. No, I read Rats I, of Nim. I've watched the movies <laughs> of Rats of Nim. I'm all about the Rats of Nim. And okay. so like, part of me was... At first, I saw this theme, I saw the rats, and I thought, that looks dumb. But then I was like, that actually pulls me back and gives me nostalgia for Rats of Nim. So never mind. I do like this. So that brings you back to your childhood. Ah, this is amazing. Oh, man. Look at all this. Uh, no Vienna sausages, though, from my childhood. Thank goodness. This one. Um, but this one, yeah, it, it's interesting in that when you look at the board for this one, again, this is feeling Suhi-esque to me in that you've got this rotating Praga kind of wheel. Is in that a rondelle? That you have rondelle in. Nice. Yes, exactly. And there's a lot of interesting little tidbits about this game. I really like that each player has their own individual player board and there are a number of slots. You're building out rooms. Basically, you're trying to get more rats to live in your or, uh, area, I guess, and um, you're trying to expand that. And so there's 
potential spots on it that you can uncover uh, and expand it and create more spaces for them to go to. And so there's a lot of these little interesting tidbits that knowing Luciani and knowing um, the types of games he does, looking at the potential combos here, it it's worker placement uh, and it has a lot of different elements in it that I love already and I I love Simone Luciani's worker placement stuff. There's some throwbacks that people were mentioning as I was looking through this to Lorenzo Il Magnifico uh, and and other Luciani titles, titles. So this is, I think, of all the Luciani games of coming out at Essen, this is the one that I'm most excited about, the one I'm most interested in trying. Uh, and I don't know. We'll see how this one goes. It's... I, I don't know much more than that, and I really want to get this one played. There's a lot more information about this one than I think uh, either Sea Dragons or Anunnaki, honestly. But I'm, again, I'm excited again. to play your copy. I was, I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one almost made my list, so I'm glad yeah. it made yours. Um, I'm definitely interested in this one. Yeah, it looks good. I mean, hopefully the rats have the plague, and then we can add to our play, right, play exactly. games. <laughs> play games. Yeah. Play games. That's yep. why they were being... Uh, worked on at the institute so i'm sure right yeah. right yeah. exactly a lot of rat games too first yeah. rat yeah right that's it that's it that's it that's all the rat games uh rat 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 big box radis but, but that's an old game big box though is new. true big box is messina new. has rats messina that's got rats about the plague yeah. <sighs> all right there's rat games okay speaking of the plague <laughs> ooh, transition <laughs> my <coughs> I don't know. I don't know. No, it's, uh, Cascadia landmarks. I got nothing. Bad transition, <laughs> but transition. Good job. Um, yeah. So my number two is Cascadia landmarks. Now this is a an expansion, first expansion for uh, Cascadia. Cascadia is one of my favorite games to come out in the past few years. It's fantastic. I recently played this uh, a few months. Well, it's been a month, month or two ago. Um, I love the simplicity of the game. It's it's awesome. You are drafting a token and you're drafting um, a, a tile that you're going to put on in your in your area. So the tiles are going to have different uh, features on them, uh, land features, and you're trying to build corridors of these land features. And you get a certain amount of points for each uh, tile in that corridor. And then if you have the largest corridor, you get points. You're also trying to um, balance getting these tokens, placing them on the uh, animals on your board to match up with in-game scoring t um, cards that vary from game to game. There's five of those that are out in each game. Um, so that whole balance of, you know, I'm trying to build these large areas of um, terrain and I'm trying to get uh, my Tokens to line up to match these scoring cards is just a fascinating puzzle for me. I just think it's awesome. And having more of that, sign me up. That's great. I love it. So you're going to get more in-game scoring cards. You're going to get more tokens. Uh, you can play the expansion uh, with up to five or six players, which is cool, I guess. I don't know if I would want to play with that many, maybe. I don't know. But you have the option to do it if you get this uh, this expansion. Um, it adds, like the expansion says, landmarks. Um, so the landmarks you can play, and uh, they will give you the ability to get more endgame scoring by placing these landmarks. I, I think the production on this looks awesome. We had a chance to get a kind of a close-up view of it uh, at um, Gen Con. And it looks great. The production matches the production of the um, base game, which I thought they did a really good job on that. So I'm excited. This is an uh, insta buy for me. So uh, I will be picking this one up for sure. That's what I was going to say. I'm, I'm sure this was going to be one that you get regardless. So, yep, uh, absolutely. I, this one I can legitimately say I look forward to playing your copy of. Yeah, I will have it. Yeah, for sure. I, I've only played the base game i think one time and i remember really really enjoying it so if this gets it to the table again like i'm i'm all for experiencing more of it yeah the last game we played uh, i mean there's you know variable paths to victory in this last game we played came down to a tie it came down to a tiebreaker it was just a nail biter to the end and it was just it was just a lot of fun so that is cascadia landmarks my number 2 game that i'm excited about all right, so my number two is uh, a game by 
Henry Audubon, who is the designer of Cosmoctopus, as okay. well as parks and trails. Nice. And that's what originally led me to this game. It is called Flow, F-L-O-E, Flow. Uh, it's going to be kickstarting in October, going to be featured at Essen. Uh, artist is Andrew Bosley. So Flow will take you on a heroic journey across the iceberg sea. Choose your path and leave your mark on the realm. Uh, what type of hero will you be? Will you explore, sail, fight fearsome monsters, or kick back and enjoy some kelp noodle soup? So this game has area movement, tile placement. You're flipping over new tiles and expanding um, each turn. Variable player powers. You can you uh, get a couple of actions per turn. There's there's no rules available. There's no real video. I don't know a lot about it. Uh, just going off the description and and some of the pictures that I've seen. Uh, but you your actions are simple. You move and then you interact with whatever location you move to. And you're placing new tiles each turn. Uh, you'll you'll power up your heroes with items, uh, eating noodles, learning skills, finding treasure. Uh, this is all from the description on BGG, constructing buildings and more. And you uh, mark your achievements with stones and I assume do a little boasting like in expeditions. So this one, it's got great art from what I can see. Uh, there's a picture in the forums f from uh, Tabletop Simulator. It just looks really cool and I am all in on Cosmoctopus, so I'm I'm very interested in this uh, uh, game. Well, and so, Andrew Bosley art like that that yeah, combination awesome. doesn't that sounds like it's it's set up to be a great combination, right? And and so this is from Pika Games, uh, one to four players, forty five to ninety minutes. If it's on Kickstarter, maybe there'll be expansion stuff. I don't know, but I'm definitely interested in it. It says the weight is two point seven five out of five. That's a good spot for me. I've got enough three and almost four games. So I'm very interested in this one. And in two years, you can own it. That's right. <laughs> Not technically an SN release, but an SN... I, I didn't qualify my list with that stipulation. Sure, so. sure. Just the episode. This looks like it belongs next to Endless Winter on the shelf, though. That's what I was thinking. It did look a lot like Endless Winter kind of aesthetic to me. Uh -huh. Obviously, that was the Miko that did the art in Endless Winter, Winter but not, um, not to say that... Andrew Bosley doesn't do it equally justice. Like, I, I think it looks really nice, but I'll be curious based off of the art alone to, to check out this game. But they, they belong on the shelf next to each other, so you should probably back it too. No, I've already got Endless Winter, so I've got the aesthetic covered. This is a you need to do it, especially. Oh, I'm definitely, I'm definitely in on this one. Okay. I mean, unless I look at the Kickstarter page and just like, nope, this isn't for me, then fine. But I'm very excited about this one. So. Going to be featured at Essen. It was on the list. So my most anticipated game coming out of Essen is a game called Books of Time. It's uh, designed by Philippe Glauix and uh, a couple of artists, uh, but it's published by <laughs> Board and Dice. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a couple, you say? Yeah, a couple that have really hard names that I didn't. Oh, I'm just looking. Sense. I'm looking at the board names. now. These uh, are the board and dice guys. These are on all their board and dice games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys. The big new umkilter. The big new umkilter and yeah. Alexander Zawada. Yeah, okay. yeah. I've, I've messed their names up multiple times yeah. on this. Apologies, podcast. but yes, yeah, yeah, we got it. Yeah, nailed it, nailed it, and. They nailed the artwork on this because it actually is very well done. Um, but essentially what this game is and why it's my most anticipated game is that this is a Civ style game, uh, more or less, uh, in that you are playing the role of um, putting together the books of time, essentially. So there is... Every player gets three different books that they're placing in front of them. These books are actually physical, like, books. Like, uh, they're two-ring binders kind of things um, where you can open them and add cards into them. Uh, and it's a deck-building-esque me mechanic. And we talked about our expeditions having a fresh new take on deck-building earlier in the episode. 
This has a extremely fresh new take, I think, on deck building in a way that I would say this is more along the lines of pool building than it is book actually. Book building. Yeah, it's book building. Because Are you actually putting cards? You're actually... How do you sleeve them? So... Well, they look cardboardish. They, I don't or know if they cards or if it's, thicker, cards or or if it's card stock type of a. a That'd be thing. dangerous if it was just cards. Yeah, like ripping. Well, and yeah. and and that would be my concern with it as well. Is are the components going to match up? But I watched a couple of videos and it looked really well done. The components look really nice. But essentially, you're drafting these pages in these books, and each book that you have represents a different type of resource, essentially. So uh, you have trade, science, and industry books. And so you're trying to build your industry, your, your, your civilization around trade, science, and industry, and you're adding these pages to these books to be able to do different actions. Each page has different things on it, and there's a fourth book that everybody can access that has, I think it's the chronology book or something to that effect. Um, but these books are what you're going to be able to do action with on your turn. One of the interesting things about it is that there's a me mechanism in here that uh, you can close your book. You throw a bookmark in physically in the book and physically close it. But when you close your book, you get to turn the page of every book that you're up to that page in, and you get to perform the actions of every page on it. So it, there's this strategy of when do I close my book? Because it's going to add these decisions about having a really powerful combo-tastic kind of a turn. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a lot of things out of it and a lot of resources. Hopefully that plays really quickly, but it sounds cool. It, it, from what it looks like, it looks like it does because each page of these books have very pretty basic symbols on them like hey collect this resource uh do this action you can collect a new page etc there are various different types of actions on the books but i mean the playtime on this is is 40 to 5 to 60 minutes so That's, i suspect that, that yes it's going short. to be yeah. pretty yeah. quick mostly which is another reason why it's one of my most anticipated because it's the right weight uh for like getting a game in that I think I can play quickly and play often because I think there's going to be a ton of combos in this game and there's going to be a lot of different options to do things. It looks really intriguing to me and I really want to explore this one to see what it has to offer and, and how it works. It has a number of different tracks that you can go up as well uh, that has variable scoring and has multiple paths to victory in this game with different goal tiles that you can accomplish. And, and there's a lot more to this game than I'm giving it credit, but like I think that this game has the potential to be really interesting, and mm. I want to try this one out. Looks interesting. From what I can see, it looks like they're actual cards that have little pun little punches in them. Nice. They do have punches in them, but I, I couldn't tell Like in the video... Uh, that I was watching, it looked like they might have been a little bit, a little bit thicker, thicker, like well, maybe card stuff. I, I would think. I would think so. I because yeah, so. if it's just plain cards, there might be some concern about. We could sleeve them. Um, yeah, this is punch my concern. holes in the sleeves and put a sticker around that yeah. hole. The, and then yeah, it, the ring stickers. The, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we could still sleeve these. I think you're right. I feel better. I, I think I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna get this one. <laughs> now, yeah. No, it looks cool. It does look cool. I, I, I love board and dice games. Yeah. I, don't, I don't play. I don't get all of their games, but a lot of them are some of my favorite games. So nice. Yeah. So that's books of time. All right. So my number one anticipated game is Evacuation. This oh, is yeah. my uh, second Suhi game on the list. Not quite as bad as, as Tyson It's the Luciani Suhi show <laughs> this <Apparently>. episode. <laughs> but this game, I, I mean, it, I think it, it's his heaviest game that he has designed. Um, real quick, artist is Michael uh, Pickle. It's published by Delicious Games. Um, so in this one, you are evacuating a planet uh, and you are getting yourself over to this other planet that is not dying i think too close to the sun that's anunnaki as well oh look, look at that push, there you go overlaps theme left and right theme everywhere um i i watched a video about this game and i was i'm still confused yeah <laughs> I did too, <laughs> on, on how it's uh, how it's gonna work but it looks like it's gonna have some really interesting things and one thing that stood out to me about this game is the action selection 
mechanic. Um, you have these cards and you're going to place them in a certain order. And when I first saw this, I'm like, oh, it's the same thing as Arc Nova or uh, animated, like I just talked about a few episodes ago. But it, it's not. It's, it's, it's implemented a little bit different, it looks like. There's a number associated with each action. And where you take that action, at the end of your turn, you're going to add up all those numbers. And that's how far you're going to move along this track. It seems like there is a lot of decisions around placing those cards and a lot of impactful decisions and a lot of things that you have to think about. This game seems like it's a brain burny game for sure. And uh, a brain burny Suki game, I think could be just awesome. I like the space theme. Um, I'm just excited to dig in and figure it out. Like I said, a lot going on, so I don't know exactly how it plays, but it's a Suki and it's, it's one that I'm told, very interested in. I don't in. think we've seen a space themed Suhi game since Pulsar. And I, uh, I know. I love Pulsar. That is my number one Suhi game, is Ditto. Pulsar. I knew as our resident uh, biggest Suhi fanboy, I knew right. you were going to talk about this game. So I left it off my list. Right. But I can't wait, and I think it looks awesome. Yeah. It really does. It looks like it's unique and it's going to have some of those mechanisms that are, you know, innovative that uh, most of his games come out with. So my number one, I will be picking this one up for sure because I'm a completionist when it comes to Suhi games. So oh, I think I need all of them at this point. So uh, this isn't my number one, but there is another Suhi game featured at Essen. I don't know if it's available for sale. Yeah, I looked at the for sale ones. What is? But it is Aldebaran Duel. It's a two-player uh, yeah. game. Oh, yes. sixty to ninety minutes. Uh, it's not from Delicious Games. It's through Dino Toys, but it looks interesting. It didn't quite make my list, but I, I if did, you're if I you're did. a completionist, I did read about this one. Now that you say that, um, I didn't realize it was Suhi. I did see this one, and I didn't put two and two together yeah so he, i mean he usually comes out with one game a year this one he's he's stepping it he's up kick, taking it up a notch yeah, yeah so woodcraft was last year's right and uh all right yeah i'll check so that one out put it on your list i'll put it on my list all right so this game uh that's my number one it is there's not a lot of information available it's from a french publisher super meeple oh yeah and it's probably the heaviest game of, of my five. It's definitely the heaviest game of my five that I uh, have listed. It's a 3.83 out of five, one to four players, 30 minutes per player. Uh, it's called Doggerland. And Doggerland, if you're not familiar with it, was the landmass that connected Great Britain to mainland Europe long ago, uh, many thousands of years ago. Uh, before it was eventually covered by the North Sea. Did you know this before reading about it? I did not, no. So, uh, <laughs> James are know. teaching. Yeah, yeah learning things. stuff all the time, yeah. Uh, this one seems to me like, again, there are videos for it, but they're all in French. And it's going to be available at Essen. They said they would have, it's language independent, so they said they would have English rules available. But eventually, in first quarter, I think they're saying it might end up uh, in the U.S., maybe a little after that. But English version is coming. So Doggerland, uh, this is like Stone Age on steroids. Uh, there's some action selection, action programming that you'd take turns doing. Um, the uh, You then carry out those actions, and you know, you're, you're exploring, you're adding new tiles. It's really unique looking board um, with things along the edges. I started reading the rules, but I just didn't have enough time to get all the way through it or to get enough uh, out of it. But you've got migrating herds of animals that will pass through and you can hunt them. You're building up your little uh, enclave of cavemen, I guess. Uh, you doing different things. You're building megaliths for your gods. You're painting murals and caves. Uh, lots of different things going on. It's very heavy. It plays, I think, uh, there's you can play a shorter version over six rounds or uh, play a full eight-round game. Yeah. Lots of components. The board just totally catches my eye. Uh, the designer is an unknown, I think. Lauren Gilbert. Lawrence Gilbert, Jerome, Daniel Snorchoff, 
and the artists, again, names I've never heard, Emmanuel Raudier, Raudier, Yvonne Gawain Villeneuve. Um, yeah, lots of names, lots of people I've never heard of. It so, this, looks like their first design. It does. And, and this could be not a great game, but it attracts my eye, and I think it looks really interesting. And Super Meeple is a reputable uh, publisher, and they do a lot. It of looks like they do things. a lot of d- licensing for a lot of big games. They do uh, a lot of France. licensing, but they also uh, have the uh, best version. Uh, people think that the best version of Tikal is the Super Me- Meeple version of Tikal. Uh, is that one of those latter games? No, Tikal, no, no. That, that, well, that's that's it's an older game. Oh, uh, okay. Is an I'm thinking of Tichu, I think. Yes, Tichu. Yeah, mm-hmm. sorry, my bad. Okay, well, Doggerland 2023, it's going to be an Essen in French and English and Spanish coming soon. Um, I think it looks really cool. And I really like Stone Age, but I'm kind of bored with Stone Age. I still play a game every once in a while on Board Game Arena. I'm it's, looking it's, for it's, a new Stone Age type themed game for myself it's oh, okay. endless winter well i have a copy of but this does look really cool and there's not a lot of things stone age endless winter and this i don't know how many other like uh there's a first sparks which is a uh power grid and there's like a themed, oh, themed really? follow-up oh cool oh, but uh and it's it's caveman right um I think that's long out of print. Well, and you got Neanderthal poetry. Poetry for Neanderthals. Neanderthals. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So yeah, yeah. and there's there's all the rounds alternate between summer and winter. You got to have furs to keep your people warm in the winter. Your people get tired. If you got to feed them, to go to the tent and make another little caveman baby. yeah, that's, it does uh, look seem, that one seems straight out of Stone Age. That's but, Stone Age, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I think it looks really cool, and I'm I'm excited to hopefully someday at least try this game. So I, I, with your list, I thought you were turning over a new leaf. Of, of all of them were like super low complexity games, right? Yeah, right. And, and you're always, you know, I've got to play the complex games and brain, you know, brain burny stuff. But you know. Then you, I, then I you, then you threw will, in Doggerland, and, that's Doggerland the, and you're back on track. It's such a weird name to me, but hey, if if you are familiar with that term, and yeah. I mean, cool. Well, uh, I learned something new, and, and I'm excited about this one. I thought Doggerland was just like a dog walking game where you're all, all over going and walking <laughs> When you dogs. saw it on the list? I had no yeah. idea. I really, I just, I really had no nice. idea. Nice. You had to go along with my tricky badgers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, right. I had to fit it in. And with hamster that eating uh, hamsters. <laughs> all right so that is my number one doggerland uh i'm sure across our three lists we've got some real winners here maybe some eventually duds, potentially well, duds or yeah. mediocre games but there's definitely some winners here and there's games that i left off my list like nucleum yeah, uh, yeah. a couple other games that i just i'd already kind of seen at Gen Con, or at least saw a preview of, and and wanted to talk about something new. So that's kind of how I shaped my list, and hopefully found a couple gems there. I, regardless, I love the lists that come up for the previews of like cons, Gen Con, S, and whatever origins. I like looking through those because I inevitably I'm gonna find something that is completely obscure that I'd never heard of before, and catches my eye and then becomes something that is really worth checking out. And I think that on all three of our lists here, there's stuff that I'm very interested in checking out. So yeah, I agree. A lot I, of good games. I could have easily made a top 10 list for this episode, but yeah, there's right. a ton of really interesting looking games coming out. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. So that wraps up our top five discussion. Is there anything you guys are excited about? No, <laughs> uh, I, I'm really quick. A ton of Kickstarters have kicked off this week and I've yes. started. There's two that I'm really excited about. One is the final girl season three. And as a bonus, if you back uh, season three, you will get exclusive access to a follow on campaign that will hopefully deliver before Christmas, which is a Krampus film, which I'm all in on. 
So which is really cool that they're doing that and getting it yeah. done. And right and, now. and that's one of the stretch goals too. As the funding gets higher and higher and hits next levels, it becomes cheaper and cheaper for the people who are going to have access to it. So, so right is, now I think it's at 10 bucks. Is, is Shelly buying this one? Yes. Shelly is. Oh, most, okay. uh, Shelly yeah. already uh, swiped the card and, and oh, okay, okay, has okay, okay. So purchased. So this. have you, you haven't played a whole lot. We have, have not. We, every time we go to play it, something it's just, yeah. it hasn't happened. I was telling her tonight, we need to start playing it. Let's turn off the lights, flip, play by candlelight start playing some scary games because it is yes it's october that time. It's season that time. that's exactly. i mean september that, is really just pre-halloween and that that's actually what i'm excited about is that it's it's fall it's uh halloween's around the corner starting to play uh these you know scary games cthulhu death may die oh, gotta no. get gotta get that out and start playing i'm horrified i've got two versions of that i got the american monsters and then you know the original um, I want to start playing that. There's just so many good um, Stranger Things Upside Down. Uh, the, the, I haven't played that yet. Yeah. I got to play that one. There's just. Uh, I want to go back to Abomination. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah Abomination. Of Frankenstein. Yep. Um, yeah, they're unfathomable. I would Arkham think, Horror LCG. I, yes. let, the, campaign, campaign night. night. Campaign night. <laughs> I've actually thought about that. I've tried. I, I, you know, I bought. I bought a, a box of an expansion of yeah. uh, investigators I have so, so much I can start building a deck which I have no idea what to do or how to do it's fine, I, it's fine. It's fine. just, just, just it. to throw something down and, and lose horribly and, then, and it'll be great well yeah. you're gonna lose horribly because it's Arkham Horror yeah. and do, how, do you have how much content do you have of Arkham I just Horror? have the core box oh that's it Okay. so I have the core box and one expansion investigator expansion but I considered picking up another one but we Pick haven't up. committed to but anything do you sleeve yet, yours so. Oh yeah, I've okay. sleeved. I have okay. spent a lot of money on sleeves <laughs> for that game because there's a lot of. Cards. When we play that, yes, will our decks? No, I thought they were all individual. It's so. all it's it's all separate. Yeah, yeah. so it's so not. You don't so it won't matter that Tyson's cards aren't contaminating sleeved. yours. Other than it looks no ugly. Yeah, you know, that's that's the only thing. <laughs> no, I'm all not right. obscuring the beautiful art so, with glary sleeves. The I, art in. Yes, just F- tan- okay. Tangent here, but the Final art girl. game is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yes. F- uh, yeah, 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 sure, whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, go. No, I was gonna come back to Final Girl as well because that when you're mentioning all the Halloween games, that is, I've been actually waiting until October. It's the best time of year Friday. right now. Yeah. Exactly. Other than the worst time of the year is around the corner. That's, yes. Yes. That's yes. Like, agreed. Yes. That. That's because you know what's coming. That yes. sucks. Yeah. But yeah. But I'm excited for Final Girl to play it because I think I'm gonna start my own solo campaign night and play uh, through the kind of campaign of season one and see how far I can get throughout October. Keep it set up in the vault. I'm excited for it. I have not committed to do season two or season three yet. I haven't purchased them because I feel like there's a lot of content in that. But if you love the system uh, and you want more, there are so many good options. Like the different the uh, new final girls and the new scenarios that are coming out oh, in season look three awesome. look amazing. Yeah. So that's one one Kickstarter I'm excited about, and Shelley already backed a uh, battle card. Little print and play from uh, our friend David Thompson. A little World War II 10 to 15 minute game looks cool. I like the art style on it. The th- the last one is Millennia from uh, Juma Al Juju. Well, he's the developer on it. Uh, he is, of course, the designer of Clans of Caledonia. Uh, another game that I am very interested in. I believe it's a Civ builder with cards. You backing uh, it? I want to. I'm going to try and get it played uh, on Tabletop Simulator next week. So Squire, Jason, and uh, I think it was Ryan. Yeah, I think Ryan said he was interested. Yeah, they were right. both interested in playing it. So maybe, hopefully, we could work out something to play that next week. There's 19 days remaining as of right now. So hopefully, I can play it and and see. But I'm leaning towards backing it because it's not very expensive as far as Kickstarters go. So. Well, and there have been a lot of good crowdfunding campaigns, like you said, coming out within the last week or two. Uh, one of which that I am excited about, but I'm not sure how excited, is the uh, Beast 
I uh, saw that. It's on Game Found. Game Found. Yep. Uh, it's for the Shattered Isles expansion. So I have a copy of the base game, the retail version of Beast, and it's one that I've wanted to play for a long time. Beast is a one versus many game. I've read the rules a couple of times. I've gone through it. It's got a lot of really cool potential, I think. And I'm not usually a big fan of one versus many games, but this one had the potential where it's got the hidden movement and the one versus many in a way that like, I think there's something interesting going on here. Uh, the art in this game is fantastic. Kind of the story that goes behind it. I really enjoy. Uh, and like I've read through all of the like flavor text on this one already because I was so excited to go and, and play it, but I just haven't gotten it played. But for me, I don't know if I'm going to back it because I haven't played it yet. Uh, so maybe I can try and get this played beforehand. Uh, maybe I could bring this to big game night and that might be a good option. Ooh, are you coming? I, I think I'm going to be coming to that. Uh, and this game found also has the uh, acrylic standees as a separate add-on. So I may just be backing uh, for the acrylic standees alone just because they are gorgeous and they're way better than the cardboard punch-outs. And I was a little disappointed that my copy was just the retail version that only has the cardboard in it because these acrylic standees are like, they're better than the minis in my opinion. I would much rather play with these acrylic standees than the minis. Speaking of acrylic standees, so I'm looking. So Vagrant Song, yeah, has been out for That's a while. A, another I, one, yeah. And I, I've been interested in this game just for the art alone, mm -hmm. right? It looks amazing. And I'm looking at at uh, just the original Vagrant Song. It has standees, and they look fantastic, right? They look really good. So I, I agree with you. A lot of times, standees look better than than minis when they're done right. Because yeah, I don't paint my minis exactly. It's just kind of a lot of times it's a blob of plastic that looks cool, but it, the, the, the standees, if they're colored, if they you know look good, I I just think they that's awesome. So I'm I'm kind of interested in Vagrant Song. Ooh. I mean I don't know I don't, I don't I'm not interested enough that I'll probably back. Oh, yes. <laughs> Ooh, come but, on. But I but I mean who knows I might do it. So th there are a ton of okay fromage. <laughs> yeah, uh, fr fromage, which we yeah. were uh, just talking about. Yeah, uh, need during for the a cheese game. Yeah, during the distilled episode, I made a comment about how if this was a cheese game, sign me up. Uh, there's a cheese game now. There's now a cheese game. Now are you signed up for the cheese uh, game? That's an Insta back for you. <laughs> now you, now you, you have to do it. it. You have to do it. All so, of our listeners yeah. want to know, are you a man of your word, Tyler? Uh, right, right. Do, I, you, I, do you really like cheese? I do love cheese. Uh, I will be checking this out further. I still have a little bit of time. But John pointed out that fromage is... Uh, Fromage is available on Kickstarter, I believe. There's also new Knizia, Reiner Knizia, yeah. uh, with Ian O'Toole art, Cascadero, Cascadito. There's two of them, and like, right. they, they, yeah, they're the same art style, same designer, and he's a, beautiful. He's a prolific designer. He, he? Yeah, we got uh, Red Raven Games has Ryan Lockett has uh, Creature Caravan. Creature Caravan. Um, With the Islebound stuff in it, which uh, if I didn't already own Islebound, I would consider getting it for this because I think they did revamp it a little bit and improve it. And it's one that I would come back to and play again, especially with a, a revamping of it because I think it's a well done game and it's fun. Then you've got Dragon Eclipse as well. Tainted Dragon Gra Eclipse. Tainted, yeah. tainted Grail. If they you... market that one weird though. From did you Awaken see the, Realms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you see the uh, email that they sent out for like, I, I got a game did. found, Hey, notification that this yeah. is, this is launched. They said in that little email, they uh, said, this is like Pokemon, but more mature. Yeah. I, I did like, see that. What does that yeah, even mean? I did see that. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I think I'm going to pass on that one. That doesn't, that do, it doesn't I, I, sell I, me. Like, again, like Tyler, you're the Awakened Realms guy. Uh, You've got to buy everything Awakened Realms. Yeah. yeah. Like Tainted Realms. What, what, what kind of, this is a um, two player game, right? One to two. One to two, yeah. one to two player. That That's tough, right? Yeah. I don't know. I, it's, it's a pass for me as well, but um, the art looks amazing. Yeah, it's got that. There was the uh, beautiful miniatures, beautiful minis. Yep, Sirens, Defrag, and Sixteen Candies by uh, Envyborn Games. The Sirens game, your cards 
you scan them at the end of the game and it plays the song. Oh, through I the did app. see that one. Yeah. Uh, we saw that at Origins. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, there's just there's a ton that just came out in the last Which week is or so. Interesting because if you ever followed uh, Jamie Stegmeyer's blog back when he was doing Kickstarters and things like that, one of the things that uh, he pointed out was that usually the end of the year is when there's not a lot of Kickstarters launching when he originally wrote this blog. And so there was a lot of people that... Um, w- started you, targeting that? They started targeting it, but they also, there was, uh, for a period of time, people took Jamie's word as being like Bible and God, like l- true religion kind of thing. And they ended up saying, well, if Jamie says that's not a good time, that's probably... I'm going to avoid that. So you see a lot more front ended Kickstarters, but now I think like the end of the year, we're just seeing more and more Kickstarters and game and game found campaigns being launched. And there's, there is no shortage of good games available. It's going to be hard on your wallet. So the ones that are upcoming too, there's a new nemesis coming. There's the flow that I talked about on my list. Oh yeah, um, yeah, okay. And then there's one more big one that I know of. Perseverance episode three and four. Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> wait a minute, you're excited about that? Yeah, I uh, demoed the third one at uh, Origins, and I liked it. I'm, but you're but you're getting a copy of it. I right? am getting a copy yeah. since I volunteered uh, for their. Booth would you at back it though? Would you pay for it if you? I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, I definitely, I wouldn't <laughs> for me, but I'm still excited to explore it. I, sure. Anything that uh, Mind Clash does, I still want to explore. That They've earned that status with me. Sure. No, and I totally. Episode yeah. two, and I still really enjoyed. Episode one was, okay. it was forgettable. For it was me. okay. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, we're getting closer to Voidfall. I mean, there, there is. Septima might beat it at this point. It could, it could. We're going to get both of them around the same time. But there's, uh, I think people are getting them in the U.S. So I'm, I check every day just to make sure I didn't miss an email I've, for a shipping notification. I've so. started logging into my FedEx account to see if I have any new labels that have been created that I haven't been notified about, and I still have nothing. Yeah. So it but feels it, good that there's someone else who is also waiting. Yes, well, but, but you know I'm going to get it first, and you're going to be yeah. like a month behind. But yeah, that's, you know, that's just, fine. Just and I'll get my copy of Septima before either of you get your copy of Septima or Voidfall, so it's great. There you go. Probably. And then we well, can play. I, I think we've rambled on long enough. Is there anything else? Uh, I hope not. This okay. has been a long one, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I want to bring back one thing. Not Vienna sausages, please. No. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Logan did say he liked them, didn't love them. No, he liked them, wished that they would have been sausage. Real sausage. I would agree with that. Yeah, some, for, some sort of real food would have been. Yeah, nice. I agree <laughs> that the texture is a little funky, but yeah. Hey, it is what it is. Tot scenes. Goodbye. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Longest Turn Board Gaming Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to check out our full-length episodes. We discuss games that we've been playing, do deep dives and feature reviews, share top five lists on a variety of board game topics, and discuss all things board game related. For even more Longest Turn, check out our Discord server, Board Game Geek blog and guild, Instagram, and Twitter. All links and information are included in the show notes. Thanks for listening. And then we're going to highlight the top five games that we each think nah our taste buds supposedly switch up every seven years or so so even if he liked it as a kid there's a chance that he thinks it's disgusting i'm hoping he vomits immediately (laughs) (laughs) and it is directed away from the computer right we don't want to lose any of this recording or the sound equipment. He could make it to the toilet. He, like, I well, want him to have enough time that he Well, could. and do not vomit on the games, right? Right. Like, don't turn right on, <laughs> into the game wall or forward. I mean, he's got games, you know. Do not everywhere. pass go. Just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But I do hope that there's some vomiting. But it's not me. That's not coming from one of us? Yeah. yeah. I, okay. I second that. Agreed. <laughs> All right. I've been wanting to do that for a while. We have a hot dog.